Iowa trying for its first 7-0 start since 2009 when it went to the Orange Bowl, won 11 games that year. They're in Evanston to face the Northwestern Wildcats with Brian Greasy, Tom Luganbill, I'm Dave Pash. Northwestern won the toss and elected to defer to the second half, so Iowa will start with the football. Matt McCucci will kick it deep as the sun shines on a Saturday morning here in the Chicagoland area. Desmond King and Riley McCarron are deep. We'll see how Northwestern bounce back after getting smoked last week in Ann Arbor. This will be a touchback. It will come out to the 25 for the Hawkeyes. And junior quarterback C.J. Bethard, who beat out Jake Rudock in the offseason. Bethard, the grandson of longtime NFL GM Bobby Bethard. He's won all seven of his career starts. No Iowa quarterback has won his first eight starts. And Bethard comes in third in the Big Ten in total offense. That's not going to be easy for C.J. Bethard in this game. This Northwestern defense, the starters anyway, Dave, only gave up 17 points in that 38 nothing loss last week against Michigan. So it's not like they are coming in with a disheartening performance from a week ago. Even with those numbers, they're still eighth in the country in points allowed. Here's Jordan Canzari dropped after a one yard gain. Canzari had 43 attempts last week. That's a school record. He rushed for 256 yards. That is a lot on the shoulders of a 190 pound back. <laughs> That's a lot for anybody. Most uh, most rushes since the 2013 SEC championship game. They, they need a better mix offensively throwing the football on first and second down to take pressure off Kansas Air. Yeah, Trey Mason at 46 carries in that game you're talking about for Auburn. Here's a pass play and it's incomplete. Bethard on the year completing over 60 percent of his passes. Third down and eight for the Hawkeyes here on their first possession. Talked about Bethard beating out Rudock in the offseason. That, of course, forced Rudock then to transfer to Michigan, and he's got the Wolverines unbeaten going into their big game at home against Michigan State today. Northwestern has been excellent on third down, just about every category defensively. Here's a wide receiver screen, and the ball's on the ground. It was caught by Vandenberg, then he dropped it. He covered it up, but it's fourth down. There's a penalty marker on the far side of the field near the line of scrimmage. Jeff Servinsky is our referee. Lengthy conversation to start the game. Offside. Defense. Number 17. Five yard penalty. Third down. So another opportunity here for Iowa. It'll be third and four. It was Marcus McShepard, a defensive back that was up around the line of scrimmage. He was in the neutral zone. Yeah, and a costly penalty for Northwestern because you don't need to be that close to the receiver when you're playing on the outside. They get a stop and now give Iowa another chance. How about Tavon Smith is in the game at the bottom of your screen. He was not supposed to play today. He's been out the last two games with an knee injury as Bethard steps up and dumps it off complete. Vandenberg with a first down. Out past the 45-yard line, and now two penalty flags fly. A late hit on the Iowa sideline by Travion Henry. It's a great call from Greg Davis, the offensive coordinator from Iowa. Understanding he's got man coverage from the Wildcats and Pat Fitzgerald trying to get after C.J. Beathard. They run crossing routes in the middle of the field and get Vandenberg wide open. And Brian, if you're Northwestern, you... you play was over. Personal foul. Defense. Number two. Late hit. 15-yard penalty from the end of the run. Automatic first down. You're coming off getting blown out against Michigan. You can't have the start. You, you have an offside, and then clearly Vandenberg is out of bounds. There's no reason to hit him if you're Henry. Yeah, that's an emotional penalty. You see the crossing route step. Great job stepping up by Bethard and Vandenberg coming on the crossing route. Watkins made a great play the play, pre play previous and gives up a big first down conversion. And again, it was... I was, was going to be off the field and punting the football. Now they're inside the 40-yard line. The pass deflected. It almost intercepted. 
Boy, Jalen Prater, the linebacker, thought the ball was going to drop right in his lap. And then Anthony Walker tried to pick it off, and the ball hits the ground. Yeah, take a look at Walker. He's just going to get a finger on this ball right before. It's a great angle that Prater was going to catch that ball. And a missed opportunity for Northwestern. Second and ten. Walker is one of their top players. He leads the team in tackles for a loss. That linebacking core plays very hard for Northwestern. Here's second and ten. Another pass play. Throw is low and incomplete. Tended for Jacob Hillier. It's third down and ten. Well, C.J. Beathard making a lot of calls at the line of scrimmage, ensuring that he gets this team in the right play. Now, one thing I'm noticing from Northwestern on defense, Brian, they are, they're not thinking anything downfield. They're jumping routes. They're all over this football. I think Iowa's going to have to be very cautious of forcing the ball underneath. Might have to take some shots downfield in the pass game. As they should, Tom, because Iowa has not proven they have any wide receivers that can separate from man coverage. They're going to see it until they beat it, and you're going to see in a third long situation right here, man to man again. You got Tavon Smith at the bottom of the screen. See if Beathard goes that way. Yep, Beathard going for Smith, and Smith with the catch. But a penalty flag down. Smith may have pushed off on Van Hoos. I think you're exactly right. Van Hoos was in great position, and Tavon Smith just got away with a little bit of a push. But it's interesting that Smith, who was not supposed to play today, is out there. We're surprised. I guarantee Northwestern surprised, but he is a threat down the field. Well, you know, Kurt Ferentz comes from the uh, Bill Belichick line of communicating around injuries. There are two point. fouls on the play, one against each team. Pass interference, offense, number two. Personal foul, roughing the passer. Defense, number 98, penalties offset. Replay, third down. Wow, did not see the second penalty by Xavier Washington. It's the first penalty, just take a look. A little push is all it takes. But again, a breakdown mentally. And that's just that, that's two steps and it's while it's not a forceful hit with your helmet all it, if you touch that quarterback after that two steps you're going to get called and now the third laps on defense in this drive for Northwestern. Almost another penalty as a defender looked to be offside. Bethard steps up and overthrows Tavon Smith or down. Now I get it, Northwestern is fired up. They're wearing the uniforms from the 1995 team that went to the Rose Bowl. 80 players are back from that team. The coaches were on them all week in practice after the blowout loss against Michigan, but they're overzealous so far. Well, you got a bad taste in your mouth, and, and Pat Fitzgerald knows that. That's what's been communicated all week. The only way to get that Michigan loss out of your head is to get out on the field, go out and play hard, and. Uh, they had some mistakes on that first drive. It didn't kill them because they forced a punt inevitably. Chance though for Iowa to flip the field and pin Northwestern deep. Not a great punt though. Fair catch made in traffic by Miles Schuler around the 12 yard line. Northwestern will be on offense and we come back. Taking on Penn State 8 Eastern time. Ohio State now using both quarterbacks, Cardale Jones and then JT Barrett in the red zone that worked effectively in their win against Maryland last week. So Northwestern takes over for the first time on offense from its 13-yard line. And the Wildcats are going to run the ball to Justin Jackson, and he is wrapped up after a gain Justin of a Jackson yard by Nate Meyer. Clayton Thorson, a redshirt freshman quarterback, won the job at the end of camp. He chose Northwestern over Iowa and Penn State. Thoris in a throw here on second down going for Jackson who fell to the ground. He did complete the pass, but it will bring up a third and long. You know, Dave, Clayton Thorson's a very athletically gifted quarterback. Watching him on film, he, he's got, he can make every throw. He's smart and he can run. He's got four or five speed, I think. In this game, Mick McCall, the offensive coordinator, wants to use his legs more to his advantage in some design quarterback draws, misdirections, rather than just getting him on the edge. Last week, that wasn't very successful against a, a strong Michigan defense. Look at Iowa. Everybody's standing up, moving around on that D-line. Third down and long. Thorson throws, and it's intercepted at the 25-yard line. Desmond King, his sixth pick already this season. Desmond King. 
Desmond King has been in the right position all year. You're going to see me right here. He's going to be in man-to-man -man coverage. This is a poor decision from Clayton Thorson. Trying to throw this ball late to the outside. You see King just undercuts it and then gets his head around. That's probably the easiest interception he's had all season. But Clayton Thorson can't have a worse start to the game than to try to force a football on third and long yeah. in that situation late to the outside. And now Iowa has the ball at the 21-yard line. Nine interceptions for Iowa and six of them by Desmond King leads the Big Ten in the top four in the country entering this week. Hawkeyes will run Kanzeri trying to get outside and he is tattooed in the backfield. Drew Smith there along with Dean Lowry and the Wildcats they will run to the football and swarm running backs a loss of three. You guys are running to the ball as you said. Northwestern's defense has, has been so fast. They get there and they have bad intentions when they get to the football. They've been put in a difficult situation here and a turnover in the red zone, but they have no they have no panic. Second down and 13. Time for Bethard and Vandenberg on the catch, but dropped immediately. Got close to the original line of scrimmage. Keith Watkins in coverage for Northwestern. Another third and long here for Iowa. Well, Iowa needs to find that playmaker that can push it down the field. If it's not going to be one of their wide receivers, because Tavon Smith's coming back from injury, you saw he wasn't able to create separation. Vanderberg's not the fastest guy. They need to start using the tight ends. And George Kittle, number 46, is a great example of a guy they have that can beat man-to-man -man coverage against a safety or a linebacker. And they've always had good tight ends here at Iowa, good pass-catching tight ends. Kittle has three touchdowns as uh, Bethard is back to throw on third and long, flushed out of the pocket, looking to run inside the 20, and he stepped out of bounds. He had more green in front of him, but he elected to step out. Now, uh, you see there, he's hobbling. Yep. Perhaps look, that's why he stepped up. Looked like Odenabo just pushed him out there at the very end. But yeah, he is very gimpy. You know, you want your quarterback to play 100%. You want him to try to make plays. He tries to turn this up the field and gets pushed out there and comes down hard. Not a good sign for the Hawkeyes. Marshall Kane on for a field goal attempt. 36 yards. He is 8 of 9 in the season. High snap. But the kick is good. So Iowa capitalizes on the interception by Northwestern. 3 0 early on, Hawkeyes. CJ Beathard clearly shaken up on that third down play. And Iowa had to settle for a field goal as a 3 0 lead. We'll see how Clayton Thorson, the quarterback for Northwestern, bounces back after throwing an interception on. The third play from scrimmage. A short kickoff here. Solomon Vault had trouble getting the handle. And Vault dropped at the 15. He's gone out of top. Well, on that last play from C.J. Beathard, as he was approaching the sideline, he went right out of bounds, just about a yard or so from myself. I think under normal conditions, he would have turned the corner on the angle there. But as he turned his face, he winced in pain, guys. And if they can't move at the quarterback position with Northwestern playing tight man-to-man -man coverage across the board, they're not going to have an answer for the receiver's inability to separate. At first, I thought he was shaking his head with regard to looking at your cowboy boots, but clearly he was shaken <laughs> up on that play. On first down, they run Justin Jackson. It's another run play on first down, something they were criticized for against Michigan last week. If he was looking for those, he probably would have had a big smile on his face, Dave. Well, he is from Tennessee. You know, he probably had an appreciation for Luke Snakeskin. <laughs> That's right. Clayton Thorson's got to get back settled now. You got to throw that interception in your own end, and you want to have tempo, but you got to be smart. On second and six, Thorson's pass to Jackson is pulled in. He's short of the marker, though. A great position right there. Coverage. Great position right there, Brian. You, you sit there and you put yourself in a, in a great manageable third down situation. That was a big confidence throw right there for Clayton yeah. Thorson. Well, if you throw the ball accurately, especially on the perimeter, whether it's a swing or a flat route, that ball's thrown a little bit more accurately where Jackson can catch it and turn up, you might get a first down. Third down and three. 
Thorson has time and he's got a receiver a first down catch made by Christian Jones his 17th grab of the season. And that's a big time throw there because it's not an easy read when you have crossing routes expecting man coverage but they get zone as a quarterback you don't panic and you just wait for your receiver to find the hole and sit down. Here's backup running back Warren Long, only his 37th carry of the season. He doesn't get much, maybe two. Right there, Brian, when you look at Northwestern, they might be second in the Big Ten in rushing, but they're also really poor on runs of zero or negative yards. So getting a good plus three there on that initial downs, a positive as opposed to last week. They'll throw it here out of the flat on second down. And true freshman Jelani Roberts tackled at the 33-yard line, a four-yard pickup. Jordan Lomax made the tackle that brings up third down. You know, we were talking with Mick McCall, the offensive coordinator, last night. He said our offense is best when we're multidimensional and we go as fast as we can. That first first down of this drive is so important to the up-tempo offense because they want to keep this Iowa defensive line on the field. They felt like there wasn't a whole lot of depth up there, and they needed the tempo to win in this game. Told us we might see some quarterback runs. This is a pass play, and it's knocked down incomplete. Well defended by Joshua Jackson. It's fourth down. Yeah, Josh Jackson, a backup the corner. Great job of reading. If you're going to throw a lot of these underneath routes, short routes, you're going to get DBs that start to jump it. He got his hands on the receiver, but a nice job of getting the right hand around and knocking that down. Hunter, nice wander to punt. And Desmond King, who had the interception that led to an Iowa field goal, is the deep man. King averages about 16 yards per punt return. And immediately he signaled for the fair catch, literally as soon as it left the foot of the punter. 42-yard kick, no return. Seven, and also see him live on Watch ESPN. Michigan going to take it home today. They've got three straight shutouts. First time that's happened in 20 years, Greece. Quadruple donut? All right. It's going to be a great game. I'm, I'm fired up to watch. Michigan State's got some injuries. Connor Cook has been struggling a bit lately. So Iowa takes over. After a punt, and Bethard dumps it off to the 30-yard line and a broken tackle. Kanzeri past the 40. Finally thrown down at the 44. That's a 19-yard pickup for Kanzeri. Well, you don't want to turn around and hand it to him 43 times like you did a week ago, but you want to get him in space. So just drop back. The quarterback's a little immobile. Keep him in the pocket and just bring him out of the backfield and give him the football. Let him make some moves in space. For Brian, he's so diminutive in stature that even with the carries and the touches, he can protect himself to some degree. I love that play call there. Let the thing go downfield and check it down. They are rotating backs, though. We saw Mitchell in earlier. This is Akram Wadley, just his ninth carry of the season. He's to the 49 for five yards. Travion Henry on the stop. Let's keep an eye on C.J. Beathard in this drive now. He's, he's clearly not moving as well as, as he was moving before the game. Now, how does that change your play calling? Well, you don't want to call any of the nakeds or rollouts. He's going to be in the pocket, and if you're going to throw the football, you've got to throw it from the pocket, so you've got to get rid of it quick. It helps when you're getting five, six yards on the ground on first down. Got Wadley back there again. They get two tight ends. Most teams don't even have one. Iowa uses two and sometimes a fullback as uh, Wadley is tackled after a gain of two. You know, Northwestern defensively walking in to the gaps uh, late, almost in a run blitz scenario, something they've dictated off of tape from Iowa that they're going to anticipate on those second down, second and shorts, and do a really nice job. Brian, they're so leverage-oriented in their gap integrity. It's one of the reasons why they're so sound on defense. Well, if you're Northwestern, Mike Hanklitz, why don't you just come after the quarterback? You don't have any concern about him getting outside the pocket. He's a sitting duck at this time. Although you're in a situation here, run or pass, third down and two, and they have their heavy package in with multiple tight ends and a fullback. Kenzeri broke the tackle at the line of scrimmage, but won't get the first down. Keith Watkins was in the backfield first. 
And then his teammates corral him for a loss on the play at the 49. Well, Keith Watkins is subbing Matt Harris from a week ago who got injured. He's right there off the edge, and he's just going to time this up and get in the backfield. He's made two plays in this game so far, Dave. A batted ball, and now this play on a big third down. They miss Matt Harris because he's one of their best covered corners, but Keith Watkins brings a little bit more physicality to that position. And so it would be the second punt for Dylan Kidd. And this one will bounce inside the 10. Northwestern will start at its nine yard line. It's an NFC East battle in week six of Monday Night Football at 8.15 Eastern on ESPN. Eli Manning and those giant receivers looking good so far. They're in first place in the East. The Eagles have been up and down. Coverage begins with Monday Night Countdown at six. It's a tough spot playing quarterback when you know you can't move around real well. C.J. Beathard on the, on the horn there with Greg Davis, his offensive coordinator. If I'm him, I'm telling him, listen, I need, I need some plays from the pocket. I need some help, some screens, some of those kinds of things to take the pressure off my legs. Thorson's pass batted down by Cole Fisher, jumped into the air and deflected it. Batted down by Cole Fisher. Iowa decided to bring some pressure off the edge. Fisher and Meyer come. It's a nice job understanding by Fisher that you're not going to get home, that there's probably going to be a lot of quick passes in this game, so get your hands up. Here's Solomon Fault trying to get to the perimeter. Tackled by Cole Fisher. So Fisher's made two plays in this possession, forcing a third down and long. And there's a lot of pressure on Cole Fisher. First year as a starter this year, going up against a team here with a couple of backs and Justin Jackson and Solomon Vault that are very speedy, Dave. And he's a bigger defensive uh, linebacker that it's going to be on him to keep up with these fast backs. And so far, he's been up to the challenge. He is their leading tackler coming in. 51 stops on the season. Third and seven. Thorson going to be a quarterback draw. And he slipped the tackle. He'll come up short of the first down, though. Fisher made the play eventually. So fourth down. Northwestern will punt the football. And that's the danger of this up-tempo offense, that you get the ball inside your 10, and you run three plays real fast. You don't take a whole lot of time off the clock. You don't get that first down, and you're punting the football right back to, to Iowa. Nice wander to punt to Desmond King again. And King immediately signaled for the fair catch on the first punt. And King, ooh, that was dangerous. That ball dropped in front of him, and he caught it. 52-yard punt, no return. So C.J. Beathard back to work. You might recognize that name. Bobby Beathard, a four-time Super Bowl champion, is a GM with the Chiefs, Dolphins, and Redskins. Before this season, C.J. was known best for this picture with Taylor Swift, <laughs> and, and that's only because C.J.'s dad, Casey, is a uh, songwriter, producer for country music. He works with Eric Church, among others. And sometimes when you have kids that come from that kind of background, you're not sure, you know, do they love football? They grew up around success and money. But talk with some of the Iowa coaches. They said this guy loves the game. A very hard worker. First down at the Iowa 30-yard line, leading 3-0 here late in the first quarter. They're asking him to do a lot at the line of scrimmage, checking both in the run and pass game. Going to hand it off to Kanzeri. Kanzeri gets about three yards. You know, one of the things in recruiting that you often find if you're really doing your homework is you find those high upside, high ceiling guys as we've got an injury right now. Dave, from my vantage point on the field here, I can't get a number. I'm going to get this back to you. It's Kanzeri, uh, Lutz. Okay. So he is out uh, or banged up here. And, again, we've seen a couple other guys in, Tom. We've seen Wadley in the game. We've seen Mitchell in. LaShawn Daniels, who was their starter at the beginning of the year, he injured his ankle, did not play against Illinois, but he was suited up. And like Tavon Smith, a wide receiver not put any pressure at all on that left leg. And you think about it, if Iowa can get past this game, if they can just, and they lost Drew Ott for the season, you talked at the top of the telecast about the talent on offense that they've lost, they can just get through this game. They, they've got the weakest schedule among the Power Five teams who are still unbeaten. Beathard to the air on second and seven. Moving to his left. 
Just trying to get positive yardage and maybe got one pushed out by Tyler Lancaster. We've got a third down. And Kurt Ferentz is the one over there that caught Bethard on the sideline. He says, hey, man, I can't lose anybody else. I got to keep this kid upright. But here's the, here's the challenge for Iowa now. You're, you're, you're banged up up front on the offensive line. Your best player at back now is, is looks like he's going to be out of this football game. And your quarterback is slowed and hobbled. So this is the challenge that Kurt Ferentz is, is bearing witness to. And he, and he really needs his quarterback now to be smart in this situation manage the game and make plays even though you don't have all your playmakers. They're one of four on third down. Bethard slides up in the pocket and fires a strike. First down of the 42 yard line. You said hey they got to get it to one of their tight ends and it's Krager Koble that uh, Bethard finds for the first down. We're going to find out about the moxie of C.J. Bethard. Step up in the pocket and throw accurately. That's a great shot from our sky cam. To be able to see the read and then Koble getting open. You're going to need Koble and Kittle to make plays now that, that you've had these injuries on offense. You got Wadley in at tailback. And he's straight ahead to the 45 yard line for about two. You saw the fullback go smashing through the line of scrimmage. Uh, Bacon Plubba, 245 pounds. Iowa is different from what we see in most college football teams now. Kirk Ferentz has been there for 17 years. He's done it the same way. Came from the NFL. You talked about his connection with Bill Belichick working together in Cleveland. They're going to be physical at the point of the attack. Uh, they're going to run the ball, play good defense, and win close games. And when they've had great seasons, like the Orange Bowl year 2009, that's what they were. Great throw that time by Bether to Vandenberg in the Northwestern Territory at the 37. That's a great throw there. They call this a circus route on the outside. Vandenberg is going to get behind in a cover two system. He's going to put the move on the safety and behind the corner. And as a quarterback, you just got to lay this ball out on the sideline. That's perfectly thrown from Bethard to a nice catch. How hard is it to make that throw when you've got an injury to your lower body? It's hard to make that throw if you're healthy. <laughs> Back to the ground game. And not much there for Wadley, maybe a yard. Right now, the Iowa training staff taking Kanzari into the locker room, brought him to the sideline, and really weren't examining him. Had him just sit down and catch his breath. Nobody's essentially addressing him. Uh, Kirk Ferentz came over and kind of just leaned over, whispered in his ear, and then got the word from the trainer. It looks certainly is on the left side, and it's from the knee down. And they are not, they're being very, very careful with even touching him right now. They put him on the cart and take him in. That's uh, tough to watch there. Hopefully uh, for the young man, uh, he's able to return this season. Three nothing Iowa over Northwestern after one quarter of play here in Evanston. And we will return after this message and a word from our AB. An extra point kicked to date. Allstate has contributed millions in scholarship funds. Well, the first quarter went kind of like we thought. Low scoring, a lot of run plays, a lot of punting. Three nothing Iowa. And the Hawkeyes are on the move, but they maybe lost their tailback. Jordan Canzeri injured towards the end of the first quarter after carrying the ball 43 times last week. So Akram Wadley and Derek Mitchell will now split reps. And this is Wadley on second down and nine. And he's got the corner. Nobody there for Northwestern. Wadley will take it in. Touchdown, Iowa. A 35-yard run, and what happened on defense there for the Wildcats? It's a great crack block on the outside, and you missed leverage on the outside. Van Hoos, 23, is the one that needs to keep leverage. As you get a crack, you call it on defense a crack replace. They come in with the wide receiver and crack to safety. The corner has to replace, and Van Hoos just with a mental lapse there, and what you see out of Wadley, a little bit different from LaShawn Daniels is that speed. The extra point, I think, missed by Kane. He's missed three now. Hard to tell if that one was blocked. I mean, it came off his foot awkwardly. Maybe it was a bad hold. But it is 9-0 Iowa. Northwestern wasn't giving up a lot of big plays the first five games on defense, but they have the last couple of weeks, including this run.
Only eight carries on the season for sophomore Akram Wadley coming into this game, but with the injury to LaShawn Daniels and now Jordan Canzeri. Wadley getting a lot of touches. That's his second touchdown of the season. 35-yard run, but a missed extra point by Marshall Kane. It looked like he just pushed it badly. Didn't seem to be a problem with the snap of the hold. Touchback, Northwestern will start on the 25. Go back and take a look at that touchdown. And we we'll talk about this crack replace. We're going to see Hillier is going to come in and get the crack on the safety. And that's what allows Wadley to get to the outside. Now watch Nick Van Hoos, the corner. He's the one that has to come up and replace. He just comes too far down. And Wadley has got a little bit more speed than Kanzeri does. And Van Hoos was caught off guard. They love Wadley. The problem with Wadley was they had some concerns about ball security. But other than that, he's clearly got the talent to make plays. So Northwestern down 9 nothing. Back to throw. Thorson to the sideline. Overshot Christian Jones. Let's go to Cassidy Hubbard in the studio. So a surprise there. Nine nothing here, Cassidy. Iowa on top, looking to stay undefeated, get to seven and zero. Oh. Thorson, the pass is through the hands of Christian Jones, incomplete, yep. right at the sticks. So it's third and ten. Those are the exact type of plays that cannot happen in this offense. They were behind the chains all week last week on the road, third and long. Now they find themselves again in third and ten. And your confidence gets rocked as a quarterback when you throw a dime right on the curl route, and you should be converting with another set of downs. Yeah, Tom, and Christian Jones has got to make that play. Missed all of last year due to injury, but he was the leading receiver for Northwestern in 2013. Just hasn't been able to get on track this year. Thorson on third, down and 10. Pass is tipped, almost intercepted by Desmond King, who already has a pick in this game. So Northwestern with just 28 yards of total offense, three and out. Yeah, that's a dangerous throw down the middle of the field. The ball's thrown behind him. You know, if Des King doesn't make that tip, it might have been intercepted by the safety. Lucky that wasn't another interception for Thorson. Nice wander to punt. King is deep. And not a good punt at all. And it checks up as well. Wow. It's going to be about 18 yards. <laughs> Iowa will start in Northwestern territory. Things not going well on homecoming. <laughs> Against USC, but I don't know how many people in Evanston really remember that. They remember Pat Fitzgerald as a player. Their head coach, Gary Barnett, who's the honorary captain today, and that great run in 1995 when they made it to the Rose Bowl. 80 players from a 90-man roster. That's now, awesome. Three, three men are from that team have uh, uh, since passed away. So 80, technically of 87, are here, including Fitz. Play action pass. Beathard in trouble. Dragged down. The ball came out. Was the hand going forward, or he just fumbled it forward? Jalen Prater made the play on Beathard. Yeah, it's going to be interesting here because Prater had him in the glass. Flag on the play. Now the penalty flag comes out for intentional grounding. Intentional grounding. Offense number 16. Lost it down. Second down. Huge penalty. Well, they were starting in Northwestern territory. It's better than a turnover and fumbling the football, but you can see now C.J. Beathard with that injury, not as mobile. He's not able to move around as much normally. He'd be able to get away from a linebacker like that, but he's but he's not as mobile enough to get out of these situations, and he's lucky that wasn't a more tragic situation there. And it didn't appear that he was down. It looked like he was laying on the defender. So they're backed up now to the 47-yard line, first and 20. Another pass play, Beathard, a screen to Mitchell. He's free inside the Northwestern 45, hammered out of bounds. 
at the 40, but he got a lot of it back there. And that's a great call by Greg Davis, knowing that Northwestern wants to bring pressure, knowing that C.J. Beathard can't move real well. So you're going to see the pressure here and a great call to bring the screen because Prater comes out of the position. You're able to release your, D, your offensive lineman and get your back out on the edge. And this offensive line, which has had some shuffling because of injury, looks much more in sync here in the second quarter than it did in the first. You got a true freshman, James Daniels, and they moved guard Sean Welsh out to tackle for an injured Ike Butker. The left tackle is out again. Boone Myers with a stinger. Beathard stepping up on third down and flips it ahead. There's a flag down. Tavon Smith on the catch. He's inside the 10 and he's out of bounds. There's going to be a discussion as to where he stepped out. They're saying at the 10 yard line. Again, a penalty marker though in the backfield. Holding offense number 65, 10 yard penalty, third down. Jordan Walsh, right guard. And that was great improvisation from C.J. Beathard, but you can see you take a look. Pretty clear hold. As Beathard's trying to improvise and make this play, Walsh is in a no-win situation. He's got it locked up, and then when he tried to disengage from Lowry, it's a good call by the umpire there. This uh, offensive line, as you said, has had so many moving parts and injuries no Butker or Myers both tackles out so they have to play true freshman James Daniels but they want to move him at guard so they have to move Wells from left guard to right tackle they're all over the place they're just trying to hold it together for an injured quarterback four man rush here for Northwestern and Beathard in trouble down he goes sacked by Max Chapman back at the 40 that's exactly what Northwestern needed that was a strong series defensively and an impressive rush from Chapman. This is just a TE stunt. That means the tackle comes first and the end comes underneath. And against the true freshman, 78 Daniels, he had no chance to protect his quarterback. Northwestern needed something good to happen on defense after getting shredded last week and then off to a poor start here today. Now can their offense do anything? Shut out the last five quarters. Good punt here by Kidd. Schuler going to field it at his eight yard line. Makes the first guy miss. And tripped up around the 13. 52 yard punt, return of about five yards. 9 0 Iowa. Deep pass, off target intended for Miles Schuler. Iowa has lost its uh, star running back Jordan Canzeri. Uh, coming back from the locker room, the boot on his left foot after being injured in the first quarter. But Iowa's big play came from uh, his backup, Akram Wadley, a 35-yard touchdown run. There was a missed extra point. And now second and 10. Thorson rolling out. Throws into traffic where it's broken up, incomplete. Brian, I'm standing behind the offense right now for Northwestern. That's a lot of real estate in front of them. And Mick McCall, the offensive coordinator, when you're constantly behind the chains, you start to get a little conservative, concerned a turnover could happen. Your quarterback's a little shaky. Clayton Thorson just seems off the mark a bit. Yeah, well, their average, Tom, starting uh, their drives is their own 15-yard line. So their field position has been horrible at the start of this game. Thorson's misfired on his last seven attempts. On the run again, and this time throws it away. They're averaging about a yard per play, and they have to punt again. The mark of a quarterback that feels uneasy is when he tries to get outside the pocket too soon. He doesn't let the play develop down the field, and on back-to-back -back plays, that's what you saw from Clayton Thorson. Now, if you're Iowa, you're looking at a punting situation in the kicking game. This is this how Kirk Ferentz wants to play football. Short field for, all, uh, for the offense. Give that quarterback some time here. A nice wander. 
Well, a punt from his goal line, his last kick went 18 yards. And Iowa may have gotten a piece of that. Brandon Snyder appeared to block it. It went 23 yards, and Iowa will have it at the Northwestern 40. It didn't look like a nice wander was the total of 15 yards back, Dave. It looked like he was on the goal line. I don't think he was deep enough in punt formation. Take a look at Snyder, 37. He doesn't. First of all, he doesn't get blocked. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> but from the side angle, you can see that he gets that hand in there. Great yeah. play. So, Luke, you were right down there. Was, was he too far up? Was he not back far enough to punt that? I was going to run the ball here. We'll get to Luke's in a moment. Wadley shakes a tackle, steps out inside the 40-yard line at 36 hey, he looks, for he about five like, yards. He looked like, excuse me there, Dave, he looked like he was a little bit short. And in a, from a, a game plan standpoint, off that left side where the overload came from, looks like they saw something from Northwestern. And Northwestern, just punting alone when they've been protected, have not punted the ball well today. So that certainly was something they needed to not have happen. Yeah, Luke's normally that punter's 15 yards deep, and I think he was a little bit uh, short. But again, Northwestern's defense put in another difficult position. Quick throw to Vandenberg. Got a block out there. Stayed in bounds. Finally tackled at the 22-yard line. A 14-yard pickup by Vandenberg. Seemed like Northwestern just assumed he was going to go out of bounds as Hillier was down there blocking. He stayed in there. Nice job. Nice fancy footwork by Vandenberg. A sloppy tackling by Northwestern again today. I mean, they, they look they, they helped Stanford to six points. Think about that. Stanford right now is playing as well offensively as anybody in the country. Wadley breaks tackles inside the five. Steps out, but it'll be first and goal for the Hawkeyes from the one yard line. How many times are you going to put your defense in this kind of a position, though, Dave? This is the third drive that has started in plus territory for the Hawkeyes. And no defense is invincible. The game last week that Northwestern lost 38 to nothing against Michigan wasn't all on the defense. They gave up 17 points, and it was a kicking game. And offensively, they couldn't do anything. And that's exactly what's happening here in this game. Kicking game has been terrible for Northwestern. And offensively, they've got nothing going. The previous play is under review. They're going to look to see where Wadley stepped out. I think there was confusion as to whether he stepped out of the four or the one. Either way, it's first and goal. And I definitely hear what you're saying, Greece. I mean, they got down 7 0 uh, last week against Michigan on the opening kickoff. I think you see right there the toes on the white. And so that puts a lot of pressure on a redshirt oh. freshman quarterback when special teams is poor. But also on defense, you're missing tackles. These are routine plays that Northwestern was making the first five games of the season. There's no question. I think as a defense, you feed off you, you feed off of the rest of the team, the special teams, and offense. You can't just have one strong unit. Even if you look at a team like Michigan, that everybody talks about their defense, they are running the ball effectively, and special teams has been solid for After them. After review, the runner stepped out of bounds at the four-yard line. The ball be placed at the four-yard line. Game clock operator, please reset the game clock to 10:33. But you have a you have a turnover and two negative plays in special teams. The block punt and then the punt that only traveled 15, 20 yards. And that's uh, that's tough to overcome for, for any team. Meanwhile, Akram Wadley came in with 35 rushing yards and eight carries. He's got 73 rushing yards here on just seven attempts in less than a quarter of play. He wasn't out there really until Kanzari got hurt. And they got Adam Cox in it full back first and goal from the four. Wadley, another broken tackle and another Wadley touchdown. <laughs> Iowa taking advantage of Northwestern turnovers and poor special teams play to take a 15 nothing lead second touchdown for Wadley. Well, you start to get a sense. Remember the guy Mark Weissman 
Remember him? Yes. We only learned about him after there were injuries, and he was kind of the last guy off the bench for Iowa. And now you have LaShawn Daniels go down at the beginning of the year, and now Kanzari. And now we're getting introduced to Akram Wadley, who's got some skills, some speed, and now has found the end zone. ESPN. Think that game will be as close as it was last year, overtime? No. <laughs> Penn State, they'll get after the quarterback yeah, some, but yeah, I don't defense, know how they're going to protect Hackenberg against Ohio State's defensive line, Joey Bosa in particular. What do you think? I think it'll be closer than, uh, closer than you think. I think uh, Penn State will come to play. Vault on the return, gets past the 20 yard line, brought down to the 24. Well, Iowa lost its best defensive player in Drew Ott last week. Tore an ACL. He's out for the year. But this uh, unit for uh, the Hawkeyes playing well today. And uh, they came in number five in the country in rushing yards a lot. And there, there's no running room at all for the Wildcats. There's no question Drew Ott was their leader on defense. You see Parker Hesse is going to be replacing him. He's a redshirt freshman. The only difference is only 240 pounds. So the question is, can he continue to set the edge the way that Drew Ott did? Probably not, but he's going to grow as time goes on. Well, and if you're Northwestern, you just got a chance there to, to get some positive yardage, and Justin Jackson dropped the ball. Now second and ten again. That'll make the uh, defense look good when you drop the football wide open. Here's Jackson, and finally a running lane. Broken tackle and a first down. Maybe that'll get Northwestern going. Gain of about 18 on the play. Uh, it's only his third rush in the game. They've got to get Justin Jackson the football. They try to give it to him in the passing game, and he shows a little bit of jitters. Just hand it to him. Trying to go up tempo. Thorson, and another drop. This by Cameron Dickerson. Right through his hands. Again. He's going to make a play. He's going to make a play for Northwestern. Vitali is really their leader on the offensive side. He's a super back. He hasn't touched the football either. Ten straight incompletions for Thorson. All, of course, not his fault. A diving attempt and unable to hang on. Was Mike McHugh incomplete third and long? That's a long throw from the middle of the side, middle of the field to the wide side. But a low throw that still should have been caught. Three drops, one drive, and you're only the only thing you haven't tried here offensively, if you're Mike McCall, Mick McCall, the offensive coordinator, is Clayton Thorson within the run game between the tackles, whether that's quarterback power off of the of the misdirection or counter. It's the only really thing they haven't gone to yet. Yeah, and that's the problem, Lubes, is that's the teeth, the strength of this defense for Iowa is in the middle. Thorson being chased, gets outside the pocket, and has the first down. Into Iowa territory to the 48-yard line, a run of about 14. At some point as a quarterback, you just got to say, you know, I'm going to make a play on my own. He's got 4-5 speed. And if he can get outside, this is the third or fourth time he's done this, he can get the edge. Eleven straight incompletions, and the streak ends on a catch by Schuler for a first down. Nice pitch and catch, little confidence builder from Clayton Thorson. Now watching Clayton Thorson. Look at the tempo right now. They're hurrying up. They got a little pep in their step. This is how they want to dictate the game offensively. And Tom, they're in Iowa territory for the first time. A little play fake. Here's Dan Vitale inside the 35 dumped there by Fisher so a pickup of about five on first down Vitale is a, a valuable tool in this offense he kind of doesn't fit anywhere but that's the beauty of him he's got 16 catches coming into the season he's 6'2 240 pounds and he's got some skills that are unique that Mick McCall has been using all season Jackson running to the outside Flag down. Jackson, Jackson is down as well. My Miles Taylor made sure of that. Slammed at the turf after a gain of about two on the play.
Yeah, it seems like this year we've had more chop blocks than yeah. I can remember. And I think this was an inadvertent one. Personal foul, chop block, offense, number 72, number 52. 15-yard penalty, second down. He met 57, Matt Frazier and Blake Hans, 72 at left tackle. There's 72 Hans, and I think, see this, this is way over here, and he's going to come all the way over and kind of fall into the legs. And this was, he's just trying to cut his man, and he ends up cutting the, the guy that Matt Frazier was engaged in. Sometimes it's just poor luck for an offensive lineman. Uh, Hans not used to playing. First time getting a chance with uh, some injuries up front. Uh, Shane Mertz is under the weather, so you got Hans playing tackle. Mogus, who's normally their left tackle, the senior, he's playing guard. Now it's second down and 20, midway through the second quarter. Short pass out in the flat. And of the 43-yard line, so they got about five of them back. A catch made by Buckley there. We've talked about field position being so advantageous for Iowa, Brian. This, at the very worst, if you have to punt the football here, you're at least putting your defense on a long field. Yeah, and I don't think they want to punt here, Lugs. I think they want to just get this ball into a position where they can attempt a field goal and get this to a 13-point game, a two-score game. And I think that's why Pat Fitzgerald is going to call a timeout, get the right play called, talk to his redshirt freshman quarterback and say, listen, don't force the ball down the field. If you get eight or nine yards and we get an opportunity to, to attempt a field goal, that's a win. What if you get eight or nine yards and you go for it? Are you in that situation yet? Not, not for me. I would try to make this a two-score game going into halftime. Certainly. I, I think the big question you have is do you have enough confidence to throw the football between the numbers where there have been issues for Clayton Thorson. If you're going to get this ball, get it out to the sideline where you've got a clear line of sight. They've had opportunities there, had some drops, had some throws. We had the, miss, uh, the interception on the first drive from Clayton Thorson. Where is the safest throw that gets you the necessary field goal yardage? All right, so both of you guys play quarterback at a high level college football. Brian, obviously you in the NFL. You're a quarterback who's seen your best players drop the football over and over again. Now you're in third down and 15. How does that affect you mentally? Well, you just got to continue to throw the ball where you know it's supposed to be. Eventually, you need to trust that they're going to make that play. You can't do everything from the quarterback position. You just do your job. That sounded like Belichick, didn't it? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> On to Cincinnati. Third and 15. And this is going to be a deep ball, and a man is there. And he made a play. Mike McHugh. And you see the nameplate is Price. That's for Marcel Price, one of three players on that Northwestern 1995 team that passed away. McHugh is wearing the nameplate to honor Marcel Price. And he makes a huge play here, the biggest play of the game for Northwestern, to give the Wildcats a first and goal. And they're going to run Jackson. Keeps the feet moving and gets to the five. You know, Desmond King has been outstanding at corner for Iowa, but Greg Maben has been picked on all season long and he's been the weak link in the secondary for Iowa and in that last big third down play he loses his focus a little bit and allows McHugh to get behind here's a little option football and Thorson keeping it and Iowa swarms the quarterback at the three yard line third down and goal you know Lugs was talking about the only thing missing in Mick McCall's play calling so far has been the inside run with Clayton Thorson he's got four touchdowns on the season and this is the area of the field Lugs where I think it'd be perfect to run him in between the tackles see the empty set right here could have quarterback draw Well, Thorson going to throw to the end zone. Touchdown! Christian Jones got free, and the Wildcats are on the board. First touchdown catch of the season for Christian Jones. You got Christian Jones at 235 pounds and six foot two, matched up on the safety, Miles Taylor, who's six feet, 195, and Jones just uses his strength to get open in the middle of the field. They had 28 yards of total offense prior to that drive. They went 76 yards in 12 plays.
despite numerous drops on third and 15, a bomb from Thorson to McHugh, and that sets up Thorson's fifth touchdown pass of the season to Christian Jones. And Christian Jones has been operating primarily in the slot. He's gonna get matched up on the safety, and when he comes down and gets to the top of his route, watch how physical he is, just swims him right there in a great detail route. Make your defender think you're gonna go outside and stick him at the top and swim over, and he's wide open. Great patience from Thorson too, Dave. In the pocket, great protection. Can't tell you what that'll do for the confidence of not only Clayton Thorson, but this entire Northwestern offense. Well, your advice to him, despite the drops, was, hey, just don't think about that. Forget about it. Just have confidence in your receivers, and he did. And this is the first point scored in almost 100 minutes of play. They were shut out by Michigan last week, and he made the big throw to McHugh, setting up the touchdown. Thorson hit four of his last four. Remember, he had that stretch of 11 yep. straight incompletions. That went four of four. Well, when you go four, five quarters without scoring a point as a redshirt freshman, it starts to get in your head. Some way, somehow, you got to get out of your head and just continue to pull the trigger. And I think that drive there before half might be a turning point for Clayton Thorson. And a short kickoff, Desmond King. Let it bounce. That's a live ball. Iowa jumped on it at the 17-yard line. Riley McCarron hopped on the loose football. Here is Cassidy in the studio. Ball is down on the 17-yard line. That's where Iowa will start first and 10. Boy, the Jayhawks, another rough one today for the winless uh, Kansas team. C.J. Beathard under center for Iowa on first down. Play action pass. Beathard going deep, and this one is intercepted. Travion Henry picks it off. Henry still going inside the 30. Thrown down to the 25. Huge momentum shift because of that big play on offense. Now they get a huge play on defense. You can't just arbitrarily throw the ball down the field and not be aware of the safeties. Here's Travion Henry. It's pretty simple. You're gonna have hard play action, but you can't just assume that Henry's gonna come down and bite on the run fake, Dave. He rotates to a three deep safety and C.J. Beathard never reads it, doesn't have recognition of the defense, and it's a big turnover because of it. Only the third interception thrown all season by Beathard. And Northwestern now has the ball at the 25-yard line of Iowa. Looking to go in again. Thorson in trouble. Grabbed and thrown down to the 39. Josie Jewell got a hold of the quarterback and would not let go. A Jewel. loss of 14. Yeah, Jewel and Meyer. You know, this, this Iowa defense has been outstanding. They gave up a touchdown drive in the last series, I understand, but Nate Meyer plays harder than just about anybody on the field, and Josie Jewel has come on this season. He's a sophomore, really excited about his talent. They're going to have something to say about that turnover. Thorson completes it to Schuler and a flag down. Paul Fisher. Came in with a tackle. He have his hand on a face mask. Just when Iowa had a play that it needed to make, a mistake here with either a targeting or a face mask. Personal foul, face mask, defense. 15-yard penalty, automatic, first down. He comes in over the top, and is it the left hand there? That, boy, that's, uh, that's unlucky. Yeah, just trying to make the tackle yeah. there, and he yeah. wouldn't let go of the mask. But a fresh set of downs now inside the red zone from the 16-yard line. Thorson throwing again and underneath to Jackson to the 11 yard line. A five yard pickup. 
Well, you can see the difference in the confidence of Northwestern offensively. And you get confidence not only as a quarterback, but the, the other players around him and knowing that, yeah, I got to make this catch. Jackson gets the carry between the tackles near the first down. Jackson appears to have it. So it'll be first and goal for Northwestern. A chance to get this down to two points. Touchdown and an extra point. Inside five minutes to go here in the first half. Battle for first place in the Big Ten West. A pair of ranked teams squaring off in Evanston as Jackson is wrapped up at the ankles by Josie Jewell. Northwestern 5-1, Iowa 6-0. First time these two teams have played against each other as ranked teams since 1996. Pat Fitzgerald was a player on that team. That was the year after the Rose Bowl. They still shared the Big Ten title that season, and Fitzgerald won another Nagurski and Bednarik Award for Defensive Player of the Year in college football. Second and goal, Jackson down to about the one-yard line. This has been a, an Achilles heel for Northwestern. They have not been good punching the ball into the end zone once they've got in the red zone. 17 trips before this game, only five touchdowns. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they don't have that overpowering running game. See, now they're going to bring in their heavy package, try to punch this football in. Yeah, they got Connor Mahoney. He's wearing number 88, but he's an offensive lineman. Third down and goal. The pitch to Jackson. Looking for a cutback lane. It's not there. Brought down by Jewell for a loss. And Northwestern will attempt a field goal. Great job by Josie Jewell. Three plays he made on this drive. You can see why this Iowa staff is so excited about the young player, true sophomore. All three linebackers, quite frankly, Dave Jewell, Cole Fisher, who had that inadvertent face mask, Neiman, and Parker Hesse. All four of them are making plays early in this game. Jack Mitchell on for a 20-yard field goal try. Ten straight points for Northwestern. Within six now of Iowa, 2.40 to play in the half. Now for today's Aflac trivia question. Aflac. We were talking about the 96 Northwestern team. Let's go back to the 95 team that made it to the Rose Bowl. What was the highest ranked team that they beat during that season to advance to the Rose Bowl? Uh, Brian, you, you, you know guys, the answer to that question? You guys are always trying to set me up, you know? I mean, between you and the truck, you guys are always trying to... <laughs> Always setting me on. I bet you there's video to follow this one. Too. So, so you're saying you do know the answer. <laughs> Should we just? I may have had something to do with that one. Uh, Pat actually did thank you uh, on two levels for helping him in 1995. Number one was uh, the loss uh, by the Wolverines uh, when they were ranked number seven. You were ranked number seven. October 7th. Uh, Fitz had 14 tackles, I imagine. He hit me quite a few times. Yeah, a couple yes. were you. He, thanked you. he thanked you for this. He also thanked you for beating Ohio State that year so they could go to the Yeah, Rose Bowl. there was that. You know, people forgot about that, all the Northwestern fans. But no, I, uh, I had the number 51 tattooed on me in purple most of that game. You know what was terrible last night is he was telling me all the blitzes they were bringing against me. He said, you know, it was really, really complicated and sophisticated. We had a, a nickelback who had, wasn't playing a whole lot, didn't know where to line up, and I just told him, hey, you come with me. We're going to blitz. And this kickoff will go out of bounds. Huge mistake. So I was going to get excellent field position, and it has all of its timeouts. All right, well, yeah, here it comes. See, you I remembered, told you. You remembered uh, some of them. Let's, let's take a look at this one here. Greasy drill by Fitzgerald. <laughs> oh, the head hits the turf. Fitz with the neck roll. Grease says, Not yeah, happen. Not I should have gone to Purdue. <laughs> <laughs> of course, two years, two years later, you did win a national title, so th things worked out for you. He was a heck of a player, man. I mean, he, uh, Pat Fitzgerald, you could tell when he was in the middle of that defense that those guys played for him. And you know what? Now that I think about it, it's, it's not a surprise to me that so many of those players from that team came back. You mentioned 80 guys back. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that Pat Fitzgerald is a head coach here and how much respect they have for him. A 
Wadley corralled after a gain of two or three. So to bring up uh, second down. It was kind of fun to be in that room yesterday with you and Fitz reminiscing about uh, that, that 95 game and also the success that both of you had in college. Well, he was one of the best players I ever played against in college. And uh, you got so much respect uh, for him. I think, you know, the people that are here uh, in Evanston and follow this program know what kind of guy he is and how much he means to this program. And uh, it's really cool to see Coach Barnett back. Uh, and, and so many guys from that team come back. Screen pass off the fingertips of Mitchell. Bring it up third down and long. Northwestern might get it back for some time on the clock. And this uh, great uh, 95 team will be honored at halftime here in homecoming. 20th anniversary of that group. 80 players, including uh, Pat, are here. Gary Barnett is here. Darnell Autry was the grand marshal uh, of the uh, parade. He uh, beat Notre Dame that year, made their first Rose Bowl since 1948. Steve Schnurr was the quarterback. He didn't get a lot of credit, but he's a heck of a player as well. Third down and eight. Bethard. And he's hobbling. He lost the ball. He fumbled it forward. It went out of bounds. It'll come back to the spot of the fumble. It will not be a first down. Here's Jeff Stravinsky to explain Forward that. Forward fumble, out of bounds. Ball's brought back to the spot of the fold. Fourth down. That's the one thing that concerns me about Bethard. When he gets outside the pocket and tries to create, he doesn't have the, the greatest ball security. And if I'm Pat Fitzgerald, I'm coaching my guys up. When he's out of the pocket, you go after that football. And they almost got one there. Deontay Gibson hacked it out. And Bethard not 100% there trying to run for the first down. So Northwestern will get the football with a timeout. A minute 51 on the clock here as Iowa gets set to punt. The turning point in the first half was that big pass play when it looked like Northwestern just could do nothing offensively. And McHugh made a play on the ball. A good throw by Thorson, too, after 11 straight incompletions. Well, the first quarter couldn't have gone much worse for Northwestern. You give up, a, you have that interception by Thorson. They got nothing going on offense. And then special teams, the, the block punt, and then the short punt, three times Iowa starts in plus territory, and they go up 16-0. But I think you can be proud of the way that they've kind of fought back here in the second quarter and at least got some momentum back ahead of halftime and now they're going to get another offensive possession yeah. before they go in. Might have the lead going into the locker room. Remember Iowa missed an extra point. And this punt heading way out of bounds. And they'll try to figure out where this thing crossed the sideline. It went out at the 25 yard line. So Northwestern on its first five drives had 29 yards. Last two drives, they got 10 points. Uh, three coming off of a turnover, but it was at that 12 play, 75 yard drive, resulted in a touchdown that, that obviously got this team going. Now let's see what McCall allows Clayton Thorson to do with uh, confidence restored, if not all the way, most of the way. He's in trouble in the backfield, though, and he sacked. Jaleel Johnson, another in a long line of terrific defensive tackles that have played here at Iowa. He's a junior, gets his third sack of the season. Well, watching Jaleel Johnson on tape, he's the one that stands out on this Iowa defense. I felt like after Drew Ott, this was their best player up front, and he has come on as a junior. You see Drew Ott. If they're not going to have Ott the rest of this season, they're going to need Jaleel Johnson to play at an even higher level to match the kind of production that Ott brought to this defensive front. So after the sack, Northwestern basically saying, all right, that's it. We're, we're OK going down in six after uh, struggling for most of that first half. They'll take a timeout here. But you would think that they're just going to run the football on uh, second and 20. We'll see if Iowa then decides to call timeout. The Hawkeyes yeah. might, 57 seconds left. All right, this is the first time you and I have seen these two teams in person. They're both ranked. Northwestern, one loss, beat Stanford to start the season. Iowa unbeaten coming into this game. 
What, what do you make of both these teams? So you know, far? Northwestern's looked shaky. Uh, the way that they played in the first quarter, coming off of a big game last week where they were embarrassed. Uh, so I, I, they're on shaky ground with respect to me. Iowa, you, you felt like when you watch Iowa, you think big offensive and defensive lines. And defensively, uh, they're as advertised. I think they're really good, even without Drew Ott. Uh, but offensively, uh, I haven't seen uh, what I think you are going to need to see for this team to compete in the Big Ten go the rest of this uh, season undefeated and get to the Big Ten Championship. They run Solomon Vault. We'll see if Iowa calls a timeout. They do, so third down and long. But you think about what, what Iowa's got after this. So Iowa, can, Iowa can somehow get this game. They have Maryland, Indiana on the road, Minnesota, Purdue, at Nebraska. All winnable games. I mean, they can get to a point where it comes down to can they beat Michigan, Michigan State, or Ohio State, and if they do that, not only are we talking, you know, they're Big Ten champs, now yeah. we're talking playoff. <laughs> now, I know we're, this is a month and a half down the road, and crazy things happen in college football, but to your point about defense, they've got a defense, yeah. and that travels, and they've got a run game as well, whether it's Kanzari or Daniels or Wadley, doesn't seem to matter. Well, they really benefited uh, two years ago when we moved from the Legends divisions to now the, the East and West because yeah. you took Michigan and Michigan State out of their division and you brought Wisconsin in. Wisconsin's not a very good football team this year. We've seen that on tape, and uh, Iowa's schedule has benefited significantly from that change. Yeah, they don't play Michigan, Michigan State. As you said, they don't play Ohio State or Penn State uh, this year either. They have the weakest Power 5 schedule among the... Uh, remaining undefeated teams. Thorson brought down at the 16. I was going to call another timeout, forcing a punt. And remember, the Northwestern punter has uh, really struggled. And Iowa may start in Northwestern territory based on some of the punts, including one that was blocked. So you got Maryland. The, the game at Indiana might be the toughest game yeah. left in the regular season for Iowa after today. Yeah, and Nebraska's really struggling in the first year under Mike Riley. Minnesota, we thought, would be a contender in the West. Um, and, and they've had real troubles, especially on the offensive side with Mitch Leidner. So uh, certainly the main focus for Kirk Ferentz, and he told us this coming into this game, I need to get through this game with a win and, and have that bye week to get healthy because they've had so many guys go down early in the season. Yeah, they're going to have plenty of time here. The last punt was blocked. Nice Wander also had an 18-yard punt that uh, he mishit. Hawkeyes come after this one. And this is a line drive. I don't think King saw it with the sun in his eyes. 37 seconds, and all Iowa needs is a couple first downs, and they'll be in field goal range from Marshall Kane, who made a 57-yarder this year, by the way. You know, Dave, he looked short again. You Normally, you want your, your punter to be 15 yards, and he's, he's at about 13 and a half. He should be standing way back here on the, on the one-yard line. Instead, he's two yards up, and that... He's kicking the ball real close to his wall. Wouldn't the special teams coach to catch that, though? Is, that, I mean, is it possible that's what they want him to do? Maybe, but after, especially after you've gotten one blocked already, and that one was close to getting blocked, move back. 15, I mean, that's, that's as, as old as football. You get back 15 yards when you pump. Bether to throw on first down to this sideline to Vandenberg. He'll step out at the 45. <laughs> Marshall Kane, as we mentioned, hit a 57-yard field goal to beat Pitt as time expired uh, earlier in the season. That was Pitt's only loss this year, by the way. So you would think, now he can't make an extra point. He's missed three this year, but he can make a 57-yarder, so you got to only get about five or six more yards. It's in the head of these kickers. You know, the ones you're supposed to make, uh, you miss. And the ones you're not supposed to make, you make. Second and two. And Beathard, what a catch! Prager Coble with a defender draped on him. Wrapped that ball up at the 26-yard line. 25 seconds to go. They're going to save their timeout. They're not going to spike the ball. They're going to run a play. Beathard, incomplete. I think they should have just spiked the ball. You yep. waste 12 seconds. Yep. It's not about the downs at this point, right? Yeah. On time. And, and, and your, the likelihood of you calling a good play there where you can take a shot down the field is probably not great because you just had a big play down the field. So get up there and spike the football. Offensive coordinator Greg Davis. 14 seconds left. We'll see how he calls this here. 
They do have a timeout so they can throw the ball in the middle of the field. The fact that Kane has already missed, you, know, you wonder about his head. I'm telling my quarterback, I need yards here. I don't need to get a touchdown. I just want to make it an easier field goal attempt. Beathard out of the backfield. Mitchell steps out with nine seconds left. So now you got really one play, one shot to the end zone here. No, I, I, I think that's a great play there because you get a gain and you get out of bounds and stop the clock. You still have your timeout. So you can run a quick play here, throw the ball, uh, and, and call a timeout as soon as the, the player gets down. I can't understand why Northwestern wouldn't defend the boundary and not allow them to get out of bounds on that last play. They force it back inside. Nine seconds to go. Bethard steps up and takes a seat, calls a timeout. I think he saw the clock and said, I'm going to get down. Smart. Yep. Call the final timeout to bring on the field goal team. The average play takes six or seven seconds, but if you scramble around and try to improvise and make a play, then you're, the clock's going to run out. So that's smart play by Bethard. And Marshall Kane did make a 36-yard field goal earlier in this game. And this uh, looks like it'll be 34-yard attempt here for Kane to get eye with three points before going into the locker room. Two seconds remaining. 34-yard try. And the kick is no good. He missed it wide to the left. Four points that I was left on the board. A missed extra point and now a short field goal that Kane could not connect on. So it remains a six point lead for Iowa at halftime. Kane clearly upset with himself for missing again. And Northwestern will get the football to start the second half. And then the second half will be about special teams because Kane, where's his head? You know, the special teams for Northwestern have been uh, pretty shaky in the first half. So. Whoever plays better on special teams in the second half, I think, will we'll win this game. It's on the board. Marshall Kane missed an extra point and a 34-yard field goal as time expired in the first half. Northwestern really had one big play, a pass play on third down and 15. It set up Northwestern's lone touchdown. Northwestern will get the ball to start the third quarter. And here's Bolt on the return for Northwestern. Across the 20-yard line. Hurdles a defender. And gets to the 37 as that fires up the Wildcat sideline. I'll go back to that first half, Dave. And these two defenses really impressed me. Northwestern is bringing some stunts up front to get after C.J. Beathard. They smell blood in the water with a quarterback who's a little bit gimpy. And Jalen Prater had a heck of a first half, seven tackles alone, and he alone got pressure on C.J. Beathard. Both these defenses have been impressive. Who plays well in the second half is going to go a long way and who wins the game. Thorson hits Justin Jackson, who gets to the 40-yard line for about four yards. Thorson threw for just 82 first half yards. Uh, the big play was a 34-yard pass to Mike McHugh. But uh, he's completed five straight after 11 consecutive incompletions. And Thorson's got a wide open man down the sideline. It's Jackson. He did step out, though. Right as he caught it at the 44, he thought he was in bounds. Yeah, just needs to be aware of the sideline. Uh, if, he, if he's aware and he stays in bounds, he easily would have got a first down. But he ran his route too far out. Once you get past the numbers, you need to start settling down. Otherwise, you're going to run out of bounds. So Thorson will throw on third down and two. They come out with three straight pass plays, and they get the first down, McHugh, into Iowa territory at the 47-yard line. All right, whatever Pat Fitzgerald said in the locker room, 
Seem to be working. Get a big kickoff return by Vault, and then three straight passes, as you said, in the first down, and you're in plus territory, and now you can ramp up that tempo. Northwestern, 5-1 and one on the year, trying to bounce back after a 38-0 loss at Michigan last week. Justin Jackson grabbed at the ankles. Down at the 44-yard line, a three-yard pickup. The, the winner of this game will be the front runner for the Big Ten West Championship. Obviously, a lot of football left. Certainly, if Iowa wins and the Hawkeyes are really in the driver's seat, they're 3-0 in league play if they can get this one. On second and seven, Thorson back to the air. And receiver, Schuler didn't look like he saw the ball. Third and seven. A big game in the Big Ten East with Michigan, Michigan State today. Penn State, Ohio State tonight. Here's the West. We mentioned Iowa 2-0. Oh. You got Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin all at 1-1 with Northwestern. Yeah, Iowa's got that big win on the road at Wisconsin. That's their best win. And then Northwestern has beaten Minnesota out of the West already. Two favorites coming in. The pass behind the intended receiver, Christian Jones, incomplete. Northwestern will have to kick it to Iowa here on fourth down. That's a missed opportunity there on third down. You know, talking with Mick McCall, the offensive coordinator, he said one thing Clayton Thorson needs to work on is accuracy, especially throwing the ball to the outside. That ball is grossly underthrown. If it's put outside on the on the edge, on the boundary, that's a completion and a first down and inside the 35-yard line. Nice wander has had a struggle today punting the football. And this one goes into the end zone for a touchback. Iowa on offense for the first time in the third when we come back. And you today, doubleheader on ESPN 3.30, Michigan, Michigan State, then LSU, Florida at 7. Texas A&M looks to stay undefeated, taking on Alabama. Akram Wadley gets the call on first down. In for the injured Jordan Canzeri. And he's close to 100 yards on the day. Came in with 35 yards on the season. And another failure to crack replace. We talked about it in the first half. The receiver comes down and gets the safety. And Van Hoos again. This time, Wadley gives him an outside inside move, but that's the touchdown he scored in the first half. Luke's talked to Coach Fitz about it at halftime. He said, we have to uh, defend the crack replace, and right off the bat, Van Hoos misses another tackle. And Wadley's right at 100 after 24 yards there. Here's Vandenberg, gets a great block from Hillier out there, throwing out of bounds around the 49-yard line of Northwestern. Brian, that's what drives coaches nuts. You work something all week long, you know it's coming, and then you fail to execute it throughout the game. So defensively, we've seen that on, on two separate issues result in big ga gains, on, gains on the ground. Now, from an offensive perspective, I was talking to Kirk Ferentz coming out, and he said, I asked him point blank, can, can C.J. Beathard run your offense? And he said, no, not to the extent that we want to, but he's doing enough for what we need him to. And I like the opening two play calls. Quick ball out of his hand, nice run, take the pressure off his legs. Hand off here on second down and four. And good job by Wadley to keep those feet moving after contact initially. He did not get the first down, though. So third down coming up. You know, to Luke's point, the, the element that it takes away from, from this Iowa offense is their naked game. They're a zone, an outside zone run team, and then a naked team off of that. The, the problem is that two of their best players are their tight ends, Coble and Kittle. And that's where they got a majority of their catches was off that play action naked game. And that's the area that C.J. Beathard's not been able to, to accomplish with his injury. They're going to run behind that 250 pound fullback. And it's an easy first down for Wadley to the 39 yard line. Exactly where Iowa wants to be on third and short. And they get right back to what they do best. You know, the offensive line is. As spotty as it's been because of the injuries, you know, they have a lot of youth in this offense front. It's still a bit of a symphony in terms of how they go about their business, Brian. You know what's coming. You know how they're going to execute it. The question is, can you line up in a phone booth and stop it? Symphony. That's, that's a word I don't normally hear with a big offensive lineman. Here's Mitchell on the cutback inside the 30-yard line. 
But just to, to finish up on what Lewis is saying, I mean, you were used to seeing that Kirk Ferentz is an old offensive line coach in the NFL, and we're used to seeing that with how these guys come off the ball. And then when you add a 250-pound fullback, Pleva, coming through the hole yeah. in that third down and short, you're going to get big games. Well, and that last play was a great example of it, as you see Kanzari on the sideline. But you, you, you run the outside zone, and that time it's not Wadley, it's Mitchell. And he shows that he can stretch and hit one cut and go downhill. That's the, the key in this outside zone system that Iowa loves is a back like Kanzari and Wadley that can get upfield fast. Kanzari was hurt in the first half. Mitchell pushing the pile to the 22, got four yards. Brian, it looks like they're doing some inside run game check with Meads at the line of scrimmage based on alignment either over under front from Northwestern trying to get into the best most advantageous run play from C.J. Beathard's standpoint. Well, they got four yards on the ground there so Iowa setting up Beathard in good shape. We talked about his lack of health but he's been in second and medium third and short most of the day and he's going to be in third and short here third and one again. They got third and one last time running the ball as uh, Wadley gets to about the 18 yard line. It's a great way to help a quarterback. Well we talk so much about halftime adjustments. We see teams that do a great job of it and teams that that don't. And you know I think Iowa and Kirk Ferentz having an opportunity to get in the locker room understand what their quarterback feels like what he can and can't do and then come up with a game plan in the second half. Clearly the running game has been a point of emphasis on this first drive. Third down and two. They got the fullback in there. They run behind him again. Wadley has the first down. Nobody wants any part of Macon Pleva coming through that hole. Well, and certainly uh, Jalen Prater, we talked about him coming in. He's the Mike linebacker. It's just a pure lead. This is big boy football. You better bring your pads. And Pleva, actually Prater doesn't do a bad job. At least he forces the back to go up over the top. But I love 42 for Iowa. He is a football playing Jesse as my partner <laughs> stink and Mark Schlereth used to say that's just rare to see a fullback anymore in college football and a tight end and, and I always got both of them that's considered unique in this day and age of college football a tackle for a loss there finally someone made a play it's Drew Smith as he gets uh, Wadley in the backfield for a loss of about three the area of the field you know you started to establish that running game and in this red zone fringe Iowa loves to take their shots with their tight ends that's where Kittle number 46 has really made his hay this season with three touchdown catches wouldn't be surprised if they try to identify an opportunity for him he's down at the bottom of the screen in the wing both tight ends there on the right side of the formation throw to the other side it's caught by Hillier down at the eight yard line third down coming up. Now it comes down Brian as you get into this red area what type of confidence do you have in C.J. Beathard in the type of matchup you're going to have on the perimeter if you choose to throw the football here. I, I like the continued run game emphasis. I think you rely on the offensive line right here. Put her on the ground and see if you can punch it in. Well they just took their fullback out and brought Tavon Smith wide receiver in the game. They're going to spread it out here a little bit. There you wide. go. Smith wasn't supposed to play today. He's out with an injury but. He's gotten a handful of snaps as uh, he was trying to call time out there Beathard but they run the play and Beathard has a first down. <laughs> first and goal from the two. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. He was trying to get the timeout. The play clock was going down. You can see it. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get what you want. You're happy about it. Austin Blight, the center, already had his head up, so he, he had no idea that Beathard was trying to call timeout. Well, the official didn't see him. I wonder who the, uh, the, the referee was looking at. So first and goal. Adam Cox the backup fullback is in the run behind him Wadley is in touchdown Iowa that's the third today for Akram Wadley this guy had eight carries on the season coming in he's got three touchdowns this afternoon well you asked me uh, if Iowa is for real and I talked about their defense I think is for real I had questions about their their offense but that was a statement drive 
by Iowa coming out and doing it on the ground with physical fullbacks, tight ends, and an offensive line that coming into this game, we had a huge amount of questions with so many injuries Ruling up front. on the field is a touchdown by Iowa. The previous play is under further review. They're going to see if uh, he was down before the ball crossed the plane. But to your point about that being a statement drive, 12 plays, 80 yards, six and a half minutes, and most of it coming on the ground. And I don't see any evidence uh, from that uh, that look that would change the call in the field of a touchdown. And it has to be indisputable beyond all doubt to change it. And there's definitely doubt. Seems like he's in. Certainly you don't have conclusive evidence to say he's not. This should be a quick review. But things. The, the uh, interesting part is coming right now with the extra point with Marshall Kane, who's missed a short field goal and an extra point, his third missed point after this year. After further review, the ruling on the field stands is called. Touchdown. I think this second half is going to be a heavy dose of, of running backs Wadley and Mitchell in that wide zone on the ground as this offensive line starts to get their comfort. And you see that first time Northwestern's allowed a 100 yard rusher and remember they played against Christian McCaffrey who might be a Heisman candidate week one they shut him and the entire Stanford offense down in that game. One after makes it 23 to 10 Iowa behind Akram Wadley a 13 point lead. That's uh, cool. Upper deck would would uh, wave the the W flags. Cubs at Mets game one tonight. And the series will come back here to Chicago and Wrigley Field Tuesday game three. I rode that L many times. I was living here playing for the Bears, and I never knew that that's why they raised those flags. That was pretty cool. And obviously, since you played here, you know it's a football town. But when the Cubs win, it is a Cubs town, <laughs> uh, even above uh, the Bears. And uh, what a great. Uh, series that was for the for the Cubs with Carl Schwarber that home run 10 home runs for the Cubs in that opening series went over the Cardinals. I can't wait to watch Arietta pitch in that series. I don't know if he's going to pitch tonight or the next game but boy when he does it's must see television. Plus had five straight losing seasons too. Joe Madden takes over they win 97 games now the balls on the ground a mishandle of the exchange and Iowa recovers. Thorson and Jackson weren't on the same page. And Jaleel Johnson with a fumble recovery. Well, you mentioned it between the quarterback and Jackson. Thorson and Jackson wanted, it looked like Thorson wanted to pull that ball out. You just have to be decisive. You can't have indecision when you're running that zone read. This was going to be a quarterback power on the inside, and he looked like he tried to pull it, and Jackson felt like he was going to have it. And a costly turnover for Northwestern. Well, if Iowa scores a touchdown, the game's probably over. I don't know if Northwestern's going to get enough possessions to come back from 21 down with a quarter and a half to go. So you have to get a stop if you're the Wildcats. Wadley to the 15 and dragged down just short of the first down. Pat Fitzgerald immediately addressed Clayton Thorson in terms of the mess in the exchange there in Greece. I agree with you. I was standing right behind the offense. He had the ideal read for what he wanted, tried to pull the ball, but as he pulled it, it got caught on the hip of the tailback, and once that ball went on the ground, they had the read they wanted, but too many unblocked defenders for Iowa to secure the football. Yeah, it's a responsibility of the quarterback to manage that situation and be decisive, and if you're going to pull that ball out, you've got to pull it out quick and make that decision so you don't fool your back. Cox and Wadley in there on second down and three and it's a bubble screen to Vandenberg inside the five dives but he stepped out stepped out at the four it'll be first and goal from there. Have we seen a pass play beyond the line of scrimmage in this half for Iowa I, bubble screens and run plays. I don't think we have it. I don't think they've needed to see he steps out with the left foot. You know I've been impressed with the way that C.J. Beathard has managed those throws. Those are very difficult throws. That bubble screen and swings like that, you have very little margin for error, and every one of those balls has been a foot in front of the numbers and allowed guys like Vandenberg to turn up and get more yards. Definitely stepped out, as you saw, first and goal. Here's Wadley looking for a sport touchdown. He's in. 
Akram Wadley makes it 29 to 10 Iowa. Well, we've been calling Akram Wadley's name consistently but he needs to give an assist a big assist to his fullback Adam Cox Macon Pleva they are destroying the Northwestern linebackers there's Adam Cox right there on the safety Travion Henry every single positive rushing play that Iowa has had in the second half has been preceded by a huge block by a fullback. Remember Jordan Canzeri last week had 43 carries for Iowa. That was the most by any player in an FBS game this year. He gets hurt in the first quarter of this game. They go to Akram Wadley who had eight attempts all season. And Wadley now has four touchdowns in the game. As the Hawkeyes capitalize on the Northwestern turnover. C.J. Robbins was hurt on the touchdown. And Northwestern which was averaging about 10 points per game allowed. Given up 67 points down the last two weeks. That includes, of course, some errors on special teams. But still, that's uh, 67 points the last two weeks. After about 30 through the first five games. Yeah, they only allowed 35 points in the first five games and three touchdowns. And then last week happens, and that all 38 wasn't on them. Obviously, 17 of them were on the first team defense. But today, uh, these 30 points from Iowa have been all on this Northwestern's first team defense. Time in state rivals collide. Jim Harbaugh's Michigan Wolverines taking on Mark D'Antonio Spartans, followed by Florida LSU. An excellent doubleheader on ESPN, also streaming live on Watch ESPN. So Akram Wadley with 53 rushing yards and two touchdowns on nine carries this quarter in less than 10 minutes. And Iowa, which led by just six at halftime, has opened up a 20-point lead. Does Northwestern have the firepower to come back? From three scores down. Here's Vault on the return. He gets drilled to the 20-yard line. Let's take a look at our Pacific Life game summary and introduce you to sophomore Akram Wadley replacing the injured Jordan Canzeri, tying a school record with four rushing touchdowns held by Canzeri and Sean Green. That kind of makes what Jordan Canzeri did last week seem kind of, you know, normal. 43 carries, 256 yards, and then Akram Wadley gets in, and this, you know, in this system, I played in this this zone system a long time in my NFL career. You know, we had a bunch of backs from Terrell Davis to Landis Gary to Mike Anderson. And when you insert a back in this system, because you see a completion there to Vitaly, it's uh, it, it can you can you can plug and play almost. It's almost like a quarterback in in that air raid system uh -huh. uh, where you get system backs, and Wadley has certainly been the beneficiary today. And. Obviously not knowing the status of Kanzeri, but knowing that it's not good with a boot on the left foot. As uh, Vault, uh, second effort, at least got back in the line of scrimmage. He'll still be short of the first down, third down and one. And plus with Iowa having to shuffle its offensive line, that's been impressive too with injuries. Uh, starting at playing a true freshman today, normally uh, Kirk Ferentz doesn't want to play true freshman at all, especially in the offensive line, but he has to because of injuries. As on third and one, they pick it up with Solomon Vault. Keep this possession going. Well, they played James Daniels, a true freshman, as you said. And, and despite the fact that he's a true freshman, you can see he has the frame at 6'4, 285 pounds. He's just young and he's not as strong as he will be, but they feel really good about his prospects of being a great player. Thorson steps up and runs and slides to the 38 yard line. Fans here wanted a flag as uh, Jewel came in with a hit. I really thought Clayton Thorson would do more of this in this game coming in. And that could have been called by Jewel there, but using his legs inside the tackles, he just hasn't done a whole lot. Thorson's pass is dropped. A handful of drops. Christian Jones has had at least two of those. Wow. That's the second time for Christian Jones on the same route. It's just a cruel route, and this is an easy easy catch for a receiver because the ball's coming straight back at you. You have plenty of time to see the ball into your hands. You know, I wonder if he's looking back into the sun. You can see the shadows going right to left. 
and he's looking probably back into that sun, but got to make those plays. Third down and three. Thorson being chased from behind and throws it away. And Northwestern will punt it. Nate Meyer had pressure. Bo Bauer back there too for the Hawkeyes. No grounding because Thorson was outside the uh, tackle box there. So here comes another Northwestern punt. It's an impressive group of, of linebackers. We talk about Josie Jewell as a true sophomore. Cole Fisher is a senior, but a first year starter. Bo Bauer, you saw there with a great edge rush as a true sophomore, and Ben Neiman. This this linebacking core in the next couple of years for Iowa is going to be fantastic. That takes a Northwestern hop. You know, certainly the best thing that's happened to the Wildcats this quarter. <laughs> Northwestern picked it up. Uh, Buckley, but uh, didn't matter. Wildcats have it at the 12. Let's go back and take a look. Fullbacks, Dave. They're still alive and well in college football, and a lot of them are on Iowa's team. This is Pleva getting a, a block. Adam Cox down in the goal line situations. Has some great blocks, some great stalemates with Jalen Prater, Anthony Walker. They have owned this Northwestern defense, and a big reason why they've been able to run the football so effectively in the second half. It's a secret weapon for teams like Iowa because, <laughs> you know, defensively you're not used to playing against the fullback in practice when you have a spread offense. Well, Pleva, 6'2", 245 pounds. You put him in an ISO situation, there's not a, a linebacker in college football that wants to do that on a consistent basis. He's not a secret when he's on the field. Gets a block there. Look at Pleva out there. <laughs> And uh, Wadley is down at the 18-yard line. To Greasy's point about the fullbacks, how they've attacked uh, this Northwestern defense, when you consider this position, it's, it's almost on the endangered species list. And for two weeks in a row, you've got Iowa and Michigan that Northwestern has faced. And you know, you've got to have some fortitude to stack up. You've got to be able to practice against it, which is difficult to do. And then when the, when the lights come on, and you know it's coming at you, it can be a little bit of uncharted waters. And that's happened now two weeks in a row. Clubba back there again. They run behind him again. And this time Northwestern able to bottle up the running back Wadley. He still got positive yardage, but it brings up a third down, really a must-stop situation here for Northwestern as Iowa's just taking time off the clock to run plays. Last week in the fourth quarter, sorry, Greece, they ran it 11 straight plays to Kanzari. Yeah, well, you think about Jalen Prater, the Mike linebacker, number 51 for Northwestern. He's wearing Coach fits his old number. You know, you know if you wear that number, you got to be tough. But in back-to-back -to -back weeks, to lose point, to be facing these ISO fullbacks, he's going to be one sore puppy after this game. Beathard has not thrown a pass downfield at all this half. Timeout as the play clock was down to two. So two timeouts remaining for the Hawkeyes. Big third down defensively here for Northwestern. After Arizona State, Utah tonight, keep it locked to Sports Center at night for a full breakdown of the day in college football. Plus highlights and postgame coverage from Jays, Royals, and Cubs, Mets. Sports Center at night after ASU, Utah on ESPN. You and I saw Utah last week. A lot of people think they're number one. I don't know about that. I don't know that they're a top five team. They got yeah. so many takeaways in that game. We're starting to, this is about the point in the season where we start to figure out really who's good and, and who is a pretender. Well, after this, after this day, I think we'll know a lot more with so many top 10 matchups and teams going against each other with LSU and Florida, A&M and Alabama. Yeah. A lot of people think A&M should still be in that conversation. Uh, you know, my number one team I still think is Baylor because they've been the most impressive team to me so far in this season. Bethard stepping up on third down and is close to the first down. And looks like he's got it. Still hard to evaluate Baylor, though, when they've had a weak schedule compared to some of the other teams. I mean, Michigan's played Utah. So both those teams, it's a little bit easier to evaluate them. Uh, Michigan State played Oregon, but, you know, Oregon has looked like a, a really bad defensive team. So it makes you wonder about the Spartans, who haven't been sharp the last couple weeks. Yeah, no, they haven't looked good. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're finally halfway through the season, and, and now we can start to see some of these interconference games, interdivisional games, that are really going to go a long way in determining who the, the best four teams are. Mitchell running outside. 
Stays in bounds. Clock continues to run. Gain of three. You know, we've heard complaints about teams maybe not performing to a standard against lesser competition, whether it's been Ohio State or Michigan State, maybe some others around. But to Brian's point with Baylor, they've never one time done that. I think the one flaw with Baylor is they continue to be a heavily penalized team. Aside from that, it's going to be very difficult for any team to be able to match up athletically with the Bears. Well, and Tom, remember last year their biggest flaw was their inability to run the football in the fourth quarter and seal games and the loss to West Virginia and Michigan State. That was the issue, not this year. Passes off target intended for Vandenberg. You know, the other thing, too, guys, that, you know, Ohio State's had some close games. TCU's had some close games. At least they're winning. I mean, there have been plenty of teams that were ranked high that have been in close games and have lost. So the fact that they're winning still got to count for something. I, I, there are a lot of people that have totally jumped off the Ohio State bandwagon, which is surprising to me. Given we, know you, we know you're on the Ohio State bandwagon, and we know you're using the Florida State 2014 <laughs> defense. So are you going to say it every week? I didn't say it last week. <laughs> okay. We were talking take about a the week off. 12 okay. last week. He had a bye. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows, Dave, you're on the Ohio State bandwagon. Well, they're the only of my four teams that I picked to make the playoff <laughs> that has any shot since I had Auburn in there as uh, Beathard throws incomplete. Third down. I also had uh, USC. We don't want to talk about that one either. How about Auburn? Yeah, oh, I said I don't want to talk about that one. <laughs> you didn't hear me. <laughs> Beathard's still hobbling, but uh, trying to fight through it. We'll see if we see Tyler Wiegers at all in the fourth quarter if they maintain a three-score lead. Dylan Kidd, who wears the same number as the quarterback. On to punt the football. Bad John was an NFL punter for a long time. Fielded it by Schuler, and down he goes. Short of the 25-yard line tackle by Brandon Snyder. Blocked the punt earlier in the game. Out and about on this college football Saturday. Don't miss any of the action while you're on the go. Stream any game live. Download the Watch ESPN app or watch ESPN.com. I know Lugs will be driving to the airport so you can yep. sit in the passenger seat and watch it. <laughs> There's no question. Either you or Lugs is driving the airport because I'm going to be watching the Michigan game on the, on the ESPN app. Well, Northwestern, 40 seconds left in the third. Down 20 points. Dorson. And... The two receivers collided. Vitali and Mike McHugh. Looked like Jewel, the linebacker, hit Vitali and kept him from getting inside. That's where he wanted to go with the football. Thorson on second down. Running for his life again. Bumped out at the 24. Boy, it's, uh, it's pretty evident right now with Clayton Thorson that his uh, appetite for sitting in the pocket and looking downfield and reading defense is about one and a half seconds. And if he doesn't find something with his first read, his eyes are coming down and he's trying to use his legs to get out of the pocket. And a uh, great athlete, you know, that can do that, can run, but uh, you don't have any structure in your offense when you do that. And uh, we, you've seen this offense struggle today because of it. And Iowa with no down lineman. Everybody's standing up around the football. Penalty marker down. Actually, no penalty marker. That's the end of the quarter. So Iowa behind four touchdowns from Akram Wadley. Leads Northwestern 30 to 10 after three. And we'll return after this message and a word from our ABC stations. For offense for Northwestern, very similar to the first quarter, averaging only about two yards per play. And does Northwestern have enough firepower to come back from 20 down against a solid Iowa defense? Maybe even better than solid. Maybe yeah, we should get more credit than that based on what we've seen here. Thorson steps up on third and 10, will run for the first down. Got 15 yards on that scamper. You know, I, I, I think they are worthy of more than just solid because they, what they have that, that's different to me, Dave, they have a lot of hybrids. These linebackers can, can play, obviously, off the line of scrimmage linebacker. Then they can put their hand down, rush the quarterback, and they've got size. 
Sliding catch by Jelani Roberts, a true freshman, right at midfield for 11 yards. Well, this is it. This is the drive for Northwestern. If they have any hope of getting back into this game, they need to score and score quickly. Remember, Iowa playing without Drew Ott, their best pass rusher, as there's a huge hit on the quarterback. The ball is out. It's recovered by Iowa. Josie Jewell absolutely torched Clayton Thorson. Nathan Budgeta was the first to pounce on the football for the Hawkeyes. Well, we talk about those hybrids, and Josie Jewell is a true sophomore at 6'2", 230 pounds. He's one of them. Here he is right here. He's going to line up. He's just going to come on the inside blitz, and he's unaccounted for. And in that situation, Clayton Thorson has to be aware and know that in an empty set, you can't block it. Parker Hesse eventually recovered the fumble. How about Iowa blitzing a little bit more, too? This is something, you know, we, we never used to see them blitz. If you call five-man pressure a blitz, some people yep. do, some that don't, but... In an empty set, it absolutely is. And, and Iowa used to never do that. They're actually doing that more. They're still Iowa in terms of being uh, Kirk Ferentz's signature on his football team of running the football, playing solid defense. Quick passing game with uh, Vandenberg getting it and picking up a couple yards. No, but it's a good point, Dave, because there there has been a slight change in the way that Kurt Ferentz has has approached this season. You know, I think the end of last year, with tough losses at the end of the year, especially the bowl game where they were blown out by Tennessee, uh, he made some changes. He talked about being embarrassed, and and he opened his mind. He opened the mind of his staff. He asked to evaluate every single thing they do in the program. They went out and researched football, and they came back, and they've made some changes that I think have really helped them as a football team. Wadley brought down to the 35-yard line after three yards. I think for That's Kirk Ferentz, he, he really doesn't quite know just how good they are. He, you know, when we talked to him earlier in the week, he, he recalled a few years back where they had a, a one heck of a run, and they all sat in their staff room, and, they, and he told his coaches, I tell you, if we go on this pace, we're going to end up playing somebody really good at the end of the season, get our tail kicked. And that's exactly what happened versus LSU. So I think there's still a lot he doesn't know, but he likes the makeup of this football team. And it's a team that's resilient and right now showing a lot of depth as well. They're 13 minutes away from improving to 7-0 for the first time since 2009 when they won their first nine games. Bethard. Trying to dump it off. He was talking to Mitchell. Mitchell catches it and runs inside the 20. All the way down to the 11-yard line. We go to Cassidy Hubbard in the studio. Baylor on its way to 6-0. There are seven 6-0 teams coming into today. Iowa is one of them. And the Hawkeyes now have the ball. First down at the 12-yard line of Northwestern. Now, I've been really uh, surprised at the improvisational skills of, of number 16, C.J. Bethel. That last play was kind of reminded me of the little Jake the Snake. You know, I mean, he just kind of finds his way around and then keeps his eyes downfield. There's the same number that uh, Jake Plummer wore. He's to the six-yard line, gain of six on the play. Prater made the tackle. Grace, I was standing right behind C.J. Beathard, and early in that play, he was actually trying to underhand throw it to the back, and then when the defender approached him, he just threw it over the top. I was talking to offensive coordinator Greg Davis on the field before this game, and he said, you know what? The most fun I've ever had coaching a guy was Colt McCoy. And he said, C.J. Beathard's got a lot of those qualities. There's just a bit of a gunslinger's mentality to him. And he finds ways to get it done. 7-0 as a starter. No Iowa quarterback has won his first eight starts. Wadley knocked down at the point of attack. Maybe got a yard. Dean Lowry on the stop, third down. But you know what's impressive is, is that, that drive to start the second half was 12 plays, 10 of them on the ground. And it was outside zone to, to Wadley. Now, this drive has been different. They've been throwing the football. So I think Kurt Ferentz knows and understands that to get to the Big Ten Championship and to potentially compete in that game against the, whoever it is, Ohio State, Michigan State, Michigan, whoever, that they're going to have to have more balance on offense. And he needs growth from C.J. Beathard. And so it's not just been ground and pound in this second half. They're trying to let their quarterback grow as well. Play action on third down. Beathard hit again, incomplete. 
Van Bethers took so many shots last week against Illinois. He was hit 11 times. And again, you got to wonder, if Kirk Ferentz, if they, with his field goal here, take a 23-point lead, do we, do we see Tyler Wiegers the backup the rest of the day? they got a bye week. They want Bether to be 100% going to their next game against Maryland. Yeah, that doesn't look good. And there was a lot of discrepancy as to what the injury was. Was it the hip, the groin, the hamstring? Well, he's a tough kid, and uh, he's played through it. And he's gone down several times in this game. And it's not a guarantee this will be a 23-point lead. Marshall Kane has had his struggles with uh, a missed 34-yard field goal and a missed extra point. This is a 22-yard attempt. And he makes this one to make it 33 to 10. Hawkeyes. Here, Northwestern down at home by 23 points to Iowa. As the Hawkeyes look to go to 7-0, get a stranglehold in the top spot in the Big Ten West. Kane kicking off here. And Solomon Vault bring it out across the 10. Vault steps out around the 25-yard line. Now for today's Good Hands play, brought to you by Allstate, a little something different. Well, you always like to talk about the running backs and the receivers and all these guys. I'm going to talk about the big guys up front. Look at his hands by this offensive line for Iowa on an outside stretch. The tight end Kittle and my man Adam Cox kicking out from the fullback position. You know, the hands are not just reserved for tight ends and backs and receivers. These big guys, you need to give some credit up front. Playing without Ike Butker. No Boone Myers. They have to play a true freshman in James Daniels, but he comes in and plays guard. So Welsh has to move from guard to tackle. A lot of moving pieces there. They play great today. All the offensive linemen you ever play with are rolling their eyes right now as uh, that pass is caught out near the 30-yard line. I, if I didn't learn anything when I was a professional, I learned to take care of the guys <laughs> and take care of you. I took them out to dinner every week. Too bad that hasn't transferred over to your... Broadcast teammates. <laughs> Second down and four. <laughs> he was until he just said <laughs> Thorson flushed out. Flag down. Thorson has the first down. Scoots out of play at the 37. Eric Olson, the right tackle, appeared to have a hold of an Iowa player. Holding. Offense. Number 76. Ten yard penalty. Second down. Now there's one, you can see it there in the middle of your screen. That's where the flag was thrown. And you're talking about that Iowa offensive line, that, that's a that's a certainty. Death taxes and every five years Iowa having a 10 win team. That's another certainty. And, and it's interesting, we, we talked with Kirk Ferentz about that. And he thought the team two years ago was actually a pretty good team. They won eight games, but over the last four years, they were 19 and 21 in conference games. But they're looking at 3 and 0 and 7 and 0 in the Big Ten. As Thorson steps out, 10 minutes to go here in the fourth quarter. Iowa was up only six at halftime, but the Hawkeyes have dominated the second half. With Brian Greasy, Tom Lugan, Bill Dave Pash here in Evanston, homecoming for Northwestern, looking to bounce back from its first loss of the season. But uh, Iowa, as we mentioned, dominant in the second half, three times as much yardage as Northwestern as the Hawkeyes are on their way to their first 7-0 start to a season since 2009 when they went to the Orange Bowl and won it. Thorson's pass incomplete over the head of Vitaly. Fourth down. I think the question is how good can this Iowa team be? And, uh, you know, I, I, they, they've They've, certainly, they've played well, but, but they've beaten some pretty poor teams as well. And Wisconsin is not the Wisconsin from, from a, even a year ago. And uh, uh, the question is, after they get healthy after this bye week and with the re remaining schedule, they play Minnesota at home, 
uh, and then they play Nebraska. And those are their toughest games. And uh, with the way that they've played here, if they have that running game and that defense and, and smart play from C.J. Beathard, uh, I don't know who's going to beat them. They don't play Michigan, Michigan State, or Ohio State. Their catch made at the 27-yard line. C.J. Beathard has been banged up, and so Tyler Wiegers, the backup, may go the rest of the way at quarterback. Homecoming and the return of their Rose Bowl team from 20 years ago, but this day has belonged to Iowa. C.J. Beathard has played hurt and for the most part played well, but he has done for the day. Tyler Wiegers, a redshirt freshman from Lake Orion, Michigan, is in the game at quarterback. He has thrown a couple passes this year as Iowa is going to try to just run out the clock here, leading 33 to 10. Wadley's got four touchdowns. There's a penalty flag down as Wadley's well over 100 yards. He got. About 20 on that play, but let's see if it comes back. Yeah, you had a chance to look at the numbers for C.J. Beathard. Not holding offense number 64, 10-yard penalty, first down. They weren't uh, overly impressive. You know, 15 or 16 completions, uh, no touchdowns, and, and an interception. And if you can win by you're up 23 points right now. You'd be up 23 points in the fourth quarter, and you can have those, that stat line, and well, that's a pretty solid team. Mentioned the Uyghurs has thrown a couple passes this year. Some good uh, work for him. And again, they got a bye week. Then Maryland is up next in two weeks in Iowa City. <laughs> Another run play and a lot of running room again for Wadley. Can he get touchdown number five? Dropped at the 37 yard line, but the offensive line for Iowa just humiliating uh, Northwestern right now. Well, we haven't talked a whole lot about the receivers blocking for Iowa, but that's been a huge part of the success. The crack from the outside, you're going to see it again. That's uh, the uh, wide receiver Hillier. He had a big block on the touchdown run in the first half for Wadley, and Northwestern has not had any answer for the crack by the wide receivers on those filling safeties, and it's been a big reason why the run game's been so successful. Hey, what if Wadley's shaking up a little bit there? He was doubled over, 193 yards. He had 35 yards on the season. Big running lane for Mitchell. Inside the 15, yeah. down to the 13-yard line. And they're just coming off. This offensive line's coming off, and then they're inserting the fullback again. Cox, the lead block up oh. the middle, and Mitchell. And they got a pretty, it's pretty amazing. Now you have LaShawn Daniels and Jordan Kenzeri. You see Kenzeri there out, both guys out, and then you come in with your third and fourth backs, Dave, and one is a sledgehammer and Derek Mitchell at 215 pounds, and the other, Wadley. Uh, 185 is a kind of a scat back, so they got a great one-two punch in their third and fourth back. And they're going to get Daniels back for their next game. Here's Mitchell, spins out of a tackle, and is in for the Iowa touchdown. So Kanzari is out, don't know how long he'll be out. Daniels is out, he's expected to return, but they've found something with Akram, Wadley, and Derek Mitchell. Ball crosses the play, and that's a touchdown. Five rushing touchdowns today against the Northwestern team that was eighth in the country in points allowed. I was about to get its 40th point. You see Kurt Ferentz talking to both those guys. He had Wadley and Mitchell there, and he's, you know, sometimes you don't know what you have until you get them out there and you let them let them run and let them perform. Each of those guys had less than eight carries coming into this game for the season, so they didn't know a whole lot about them. Find something out today. 40 to 10. Iowa, they've outscored Northwestern 24-0 here in the second half. 
And it's been a couple of backup running backs. Wadley and Mitchell getting it done. John Harris is in. A lot of people think that's not really a drop off for Florida quarterback. What will Brandon Harris, the LSU quarterback, do in this game tonight? You know, you know who hasn't been talking about uh, any of that stuff is the LSU defense. Let's take a look at today's AT&T strong performance. The run game for Iowa, especially here in the second half with Wadley getting four touchdowns on the ground, tying a school record held by Jordan Canzeri, who last week set a school record with 43 attempts. He was injured in this game, and so Wadley came in and scored four times. The recipe hasn't changed at Iowa. Running backs and offensive linemen and controlling the clock. That's been their recipe for quite some time, play some defense. And looks like Kirk Ferentz has, has that recipe working to perfection so far this year. Almost 200 yards for Wadley, had 35 on the season coming in to the game. Meanwhile, uh, Northwestern with the new quarterback, Zach Oliver, threw the pass on uh, first down. Started the season finale last year for Northwestern against Illinois. Flushed out of the pocket here. Flag down and another drop. This one by Vitale. Penalty is on Northwestern. Holding. Offense. Number 76. 10 yard penalty. Second down. Dave, you were referencing earlier, you know, every four, five, six years, this is what Iowa does. And I think there's a correlation between the ability to bring in and develop players at a normal pace. And by that meaning redshirting, which is becoming almost an afterthought in college football right now. 35 players that were redshirted players within the two deep of Iowa right now. A lot of upperclassmen, juniors, seniors. And when you have that, and then you have those classes depart within a year or two, you tend to take a dip because this isn't a program at Iowa that's going to come in with tremendous athletes and speed and just win on skill. They're going to be well coached. They're going to be technique savvy. They're going to be developed through strength and conditioning. And the ability to redshirt is why I think every four, five, six years you have a season like this. You know, it's interesting, too, is Oliver throws deep here out of bounds as a flag comes in. They average Iowa over the last five years, five players drafted per year. So, and a lot of that is offensive and defensive linemen, but, and, but guys don't leave early here. They, they stay. Occasionally guys will leave after their junior season. You rarely see anybody leave after three, uh, you know, three seasons as a, as a redshirt sophomore. But Kirk Ferentz has a pretty good track record of sending players to the NFL, most in the Big Ten since 2011, 22 players. Yeah, and I was, you know, I was talking with Gary Barnett on the field before the game uh, about this. He said, you know, and the other thing is you got to think about the spike that they get in recruiting from something like, like what happens in 2009. They go to the Orange Bowl, and, and they have a good season, and, and then all of a sudden Kurt Ferentz can, can recruit a little bit better. But i I, I got to be honest, guys. There's a couple players, not just a couple. There's a handful of players on this Iowa team now that are true sophomores that – that are playing a lot of snaps and meaningful snaps. You saw one right there, and Josie Jewell, some of these guys on the defensive side, Neiman, uh, James Daniels, a true freshman on, on offense, and the two running backs we've been talking about, both true sophomores. So, yes, there's a nucleus of, of older players, but there's some young talent here as well on this team. Oliver's pass is dropped again. My goodness. Another drop. This one by McHugh. And I think what they're realizing, too, and particularly with some of these skill guys that they get that can come in and create some mismatches, add some speed to the football field, that they can throw those younger guys in there and spot duty and get some noticeable returns. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a bunch of them. You're not going to see that. But a couple here and there, some key spots that they rely on, like the running back position, like the linebacker position, makes a, it makes a difference. Well, in loops, they're having to, right? I mean, they didn't plan to play Wadley and Mitchell coming into this season. They planned to have LaShawn Daniels as their power back, who's a junior, and Kanzari as their change of pace guy, who's a senior. Both guys go down, and you have to rely on two true sophomores. So a lot of it is necessity for Kurt Ferentz. Oliver's pass incomplete. 
I think Iowa fans, though, still are, are curious why there are these gaps, even though uh, players are, are redshirting and most of the players that have an impact are veteran players normally for Iowa. Why are these stretches of three, four years where they're uh, around 500 in conference play and winning seven or eight games? As uh, Oliver drops the pass again here, and this one's off target, third down. Well, I, I mean, part of it, it's not all of it, but part of it is the schedule. And, you know, you, you, you make the change from the Legends to, to now in the, in the West Division, and you lose games against Michigan and Michigan State, who this year are really good football teams. You replace them with Wisconsin, uh, and, and as you see, these are the, the teams that, that they don't play. The top four teams, arguably, in all of the Big Ten, are on the east side, and, and Iowa doesn't play any of them. Oliver on third down and long, out of bounds. You know, the other thing, though, oh, Kirk Ferentz has been there for 17 years. There are some fans in Iowa City that, you know, want more. But if Kirk Ferentz wasn't at Iowa, if they didn't want him there, there'd be teams in, in yeah. schools yeah. and teams in the NFL lining up to take him. He's already turned down several jobs, and even at this stage, uh, there would be schools and major conferences and NFL teams that would want Kirk Ferentz as their head coach. Right, and that, that hasn't changed for the past 15 years. Teams have won at Kirk Ferentz. Another bad punt by Nieswander. Uh, it's just been a miserable day for Northwestern. Nieswander in particular. The fact that Michigan is not allowed a point in three games is remarkable. It's been 20 years since that's happened. So I don't think it's going to happen today, but I think it's it's going to be a hard-fought Michigan win. I'll put that. Mitchell trying to get outside does up to the 27-yard line. At some point, though, I mean, you got to think Michigan's going to make a, a mistake. They, they played mistake-free football on offense the last three weeks. So what happens when there's an interception or, or a, a sack or a couple negative plays and there's some adversity which they haven't had to face the last few weeks? Yeah, not the last not the last few weeks. Obviously, I think they learned a lot from that first game going on the road, playing against Utah, turning the ball over three times. And then Jim Harbaugh had an opportunity to sit in the film room with Jake Rudock and say, listen, we lost this game by seven points. We had a chance to win it at the end. And you threw three interceptions, one return for a touchdown. Can you imagine how good we would be if you just protect the football and he's really taking that to heart. That's a big gain into Northwestern territory to the 46 yard line. Now I know that when you know as a Michigan alum when Jim Harbaugh got the job you along with a lot of Michigan alums were excited about that. Are you surprised that he's turned things around this quickly. You know when I went there in the spring and had a chance to watch them practice and they had the four hour practices. Uh, I knew that that this was going to turn pretty quickly now now to have three shutouts in a row no I didn't anticipate that um, you know big key if we're people watching this game Iowa fans was getting Jake Rudock in and allowing him to, to compete with Shane Morris and eventually he won the job and now he's protecting the football and managing the offense and I think they that decision that Kurt Ferentz made early in the spring to go with C.J. Beathard over Jake Rudock worked out for both teams uh, certainly it's worked out for Ferentz here in Iowa and C.J. Beathard um, and, and Michigan got a player that is smart and that is experienced and that certainly has his team playing well also. Marcus McShep McShepard is shaken up. Well, uh, Michigan wins that game today against Michigan State and you know, even with if Ohio State beats Penn State tonight, I mean, you, you got to say that the front runners to play in the Big Ten title game are Michigan Iowa. <laughs> yeah. No one thought that going into the regular season because Michigan hosts Ohio State on the last day of the regular season. And you knew that one was going to be big anyway. It might uh, end up being as big as any Michigan-Ohio State game ever if both those teams keep winning. But obviously a lot of football left. And uh, Ohio State has been up and down. They did pull away from Maryland last week. But uh, Michigan has been spectacular since that uh, opening season loss to Utah. Michigan State, uh, we had them against Air Force really since the second half of that Air Force game. Yeah, they, they haven't looked the same. It's been choppy. Been really choppy. And they've had injuries too. But like like Iowa, who's had injuries on their offensive front, so has Michigan State. And both teams have remained undefeated. 
now I think is going to be a much bigger challenge for Michigan State uh, this afternoon than, than it was here against Northwestern. But, you know, I, I think it's kind of overlooked that decision that Kurt Ferentz made back in the spring, actually back just after the, the, the bowl game uh, to, to start C.J. Beathard, uh, really gave him the space and the opportunity to assume the leadership role on this team. And that's gone a long way in making this a better football team rather than having two quarterbacks that are fighting it out till the very start of the season. Going back to Michigan State, fellas, you know, one thing the last couple of weeks they've really struggled with, is certainly the injuries have hit them in the offensive line, but they have struggled versus pressure. And from our Air Force game that we broadcasted on, even through the Purdue game, Rutgers last week struggled to handle protection up front, vastly affected quarterback Connor Cook. And as we've talked about, and you know, we've been tongue in cheek about how impressive the three goose eggs have been for Michigan on defense. I'm going to be very interested to see how Michigan State holds up if Michigan decides uh, to come after them because all for the last two weeks on tape, that's where Michigan State has really struggled the worst. And I think the second thing about Michigan, Greece, you went there and saw them in the spring. I, I saw them in the spring as well, but I don't think you can ever, ever undervalue confidence. And that's what this team has right now. And there's a belief system there. And a lot of that has to do with how the head coach is perceived. And in today's era of, of perceptions and how kids look at coaches and respond to coaches, they see a guy who coached in a Super Bowl. They see a guy who resurrected a program. So the buy-in factor becomes heightened. You don't have as many guys bucking the system or, you know, not buying in. I think that's played a significant role as well. By the way, Derek Mitchell was shaking up their Lukes and hobbled to the Iowa sideline. So who are you picking, Michigan or Michigan State, Lukes? I'm going actually with Michigan today. I'm going to go with Michigan State. Oh, I, think Spartan, shock. I think the Spartans are going to win in Ann Arbor. Play fake. Uyghurs rolling out. Incomplete. 217 that's, remaining. That's a, a, you know, I know it's the end of the game here, but that's a significant uh, injury there. Derek Mitchell uh, coming off because uh, it, it looks like Kanzari has had a significant injury. And we don't know where LaShawn Daniels uh, is kind of in his, his ability to come back and play. Um, and if they lose Mitchell, they'd be down to Akron Wadley, and that'd be it. And with a bye week, that'll help Daniels in his recovery. We you know, hope that Kanzari's all right. It didn't look good. Anytime you cart it off and you get that boot on, you know it's it's serious. Question is, is it season ending? And I was been pretty coy about the injury thing all week long since there are guys that play today that we didn't think we're gonna play like Tavon Smith. There's Wadley who's got the four touchdowns and uh, over 200 rushing yards on the game. 205 for Wadley. A season high as a team. 287 yards of the ground. Most of that coming in the second half for the Hawkeyes. Handed off to the fullback, Kulik, and he is to the 15 yard line. Brian, you referenced uh, Jordan Kanzeri with uh, what looks to be a significant left ankle injury as he's in a boot right now on the sideline working on Derek Mitchell's right ankle just at the top of his foot uh, as your tibia and fibula comes down into the ankle. A lot of pressure being applied there as they work on his right ankle. So the next man up uh, that's getting thin. That's why uh, Wadley, Tom, has had to come back into the game here with a minute to go. And just give it to uh, Kulik, the fullback back again. Back. Let's go to Cassidy in the studio. Great Kulik, the ball carrier. Back away, Fabio Venable. All right, and uh, 330 ESPN, it's Michigan and Michigan State. Uh, Iowa with a third down and three, 30 seconds away from a win over Northwestern. This will be two straight losses for the Wildcats. Iowa will go to 7-0 for the first time since 2009 when the Hawkeyes started 9-0 and ended up winning 11 games, including the Orange Bowl. It was a six-point game at halftime, but Iowa outscores Northwestern 24-0 in the second half. 40-10 is the final score.
Well, say what you want about the schedule, but it's time to start talking about the Iowa Hawkeyes. They're 7-0. They've got a bye week. They have, at least according to current records, they have the weakest 